and welcome to uh, welcome to the session of the uh, finance committee. Uh, are there any apologies? It's Matthew, Paul. Okay. I'm to be here. And you haven't received any delegated authority now. Okay. Uh, anybody? Any declarations of interest to make? No. Uh, two items of Chairman's business. Uh, Department of Finance 21-22 Public Expenditure COVID Exercise. Uh, members, it is understood that the Department has asked other departments to participate in a 21-22 COVID budgeting exercise where they have been asked to provide updates on their COVID-related capital and resource requirements. Uh, are we content to write to the Department and seek further details in this regard for the briefing for the main estimates later in May? Are we content? Content. Uh, sorry. Uh, the other item was the draft minutes of proceedings. Apologies for that. The draft minutes of uh, the meeting are on the, of the 5th of May 21 are page 7. Are we content that the draft minutes are an accurate record of the proceedings? Are we agreed? Say aye. 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 Carried. There are no other matters arising. Now, can we bring Stephen? Can we bring uh, John Ireland, uh, uh, Dame, uh, Dame Rice, and uh, Claire Murdoch, please, into the uh, spotlight? If this works, are we up and running? Yep, Excellent. Uh, so it feels like in the Eurovision Song Contest. Hello, Edinburgh. Are you coming in <laughs> loud and clear? And could you hear us loud and clear? That's not Edinburgh. Oh, That's Malik. I can see all of you. And can you hear me? I can indeed, Susan. That's a, a, that's excellent. And th thank you very much indeed for coming on. Sometimes we have a few problems with the uh, technology, and she's just right. Somebody bringing you a cup of coffee is spot on. <laughs> uh, You're not supposed to say that. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, if it makes you feel any happier, I'm having my sort of uh, I'm having my copy here. Uh, team, the session is being recorded by Hansard. The briefing note is at page 17. Uh, the Scottish Fiscal Council's evidence paper is at page 25. The uh, 21 SFC forecast report is as page 35. SFC data needs statements of page 53, and the OECD review of the FSC is page 76. Um, Dame Susan, are you happy with Dame Susan, or would Susan work? Um, sorry, I lost your voice briefly. Are you asking me to just say a few words at the beginning? Uh, yes, please. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I'll say good afternoon. Thank you all for inviting the Scottish Fiscal Commission to give some evidence today. Now, I'm joined, as you've already noted, by two of my colleagues, John Ireland, who's Chief Executive of the Commission, and Claire Murdoch, uh, who uh, has a very senior role in the Commission, who's worked for the Commission for five years now, and like me, was involved in our transition from a non-statutory body to our current statutory body. You've got a lot of history as well as the current uh, amongst the three of us. We're more than happy to answer, answer any questions you have about our experiences of setting up and working as an independent fiscal institution or fiscal council in Scotland. But I thought it would be useful if I first drew out a few points around our origins, key working relationships, and about our independence. The Scottish Fiscal Commission was formed in 2014 when new tax powers were first devolved to the Scottish Government. Back then, we comprised three commissioners, two colleagues and myself as chair, all part-time, unpaid, and with no support at all, a bit of like the Three Musketeers. We were responsible for judging whether the Scottish Government's forecasts of receipts from the then newly devolved taxes were reasonable. And that was our, our parameter, was reasonableness. It was a job of scrutiny. Then in April 2017, a year after the Scottish Government agreed its new fiscal framework and the Scotland Act 2016 had been passed, the remit and responsibilities of the Commission, of our Commission, changed profoundly. We became Scotland's official fiscal and economic forecaster, an independent statutory body responsible for producing the central forecasts ourselves rather than simply vetting the government's forecasts. Our work now is to forecast the Scottish economy, devolved tax revenues, and the newly expanded suite of devolved social security payments. In addition, we have to assess the reasonableness of the Scottish government's borrowing plans 
And to do this, we now take a broader look at the Scottish government's funding and how that changes over the course of a year. We've also expanded. We're now four commissioners, still part-time, but we are paid to some extent, and we're supported by 22 brilliant staff. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have any pigeons on our payroll, however, so um, <laughs> today. <laughs> we did take a look back. That was funny. Uh, we, uh, we took an early decision that the forecast would be produced in-house by our own analysts, and there was a reason for that, and that the models would be owned and maintained within the Commission. We share copies of our models with the Scottish Government's analysts so that they can provide advice to ministers on the same basis that we prepare our forecasts. But ultimately, as commissioners, we four are personally responsible for the forecast. We sign off the forecast judgments. We're in the room when the government challenges on the forecast. We sign the forecast document. This contrasts, for instance, with the approach taken by our colleagues in London at the Office for Budget Responsibility, the OBR, who commissioned their fiscal forecast from relevant UK government departments. Scotland's one of a very few sub-national countries in the world with an independent fiscal forecaster, so we're conscious of others looking in at us and especially of how our role dovetails with the OBRs in London. The OBR plays a comprehensive UK-wide role that includes a broader remit on expenditure than ours, as well as on issues such as fiscal sustainability, where the UK government's borrowing powers are obviously much wider than those of the Scottish government. The OBR takes a top-down view of the UK and its regions. In our commission, we draw on new data sources in order to take a bottom-up view of Scotland. Although we work closely with the OBR, we're firmly independent of them, as we are of the Scottish and UK governments, and we can reach different conclusions and different judgments to the OBR in producing our Scottish forecasts. I'll turn finally then to independence, not, I say, Scottish independence, uh, but with a lowercase i, and I must emphasize that um, we're not looking at uh, political independence because that's a matter on which the mission must and is strictly impartial, but I refer to the independence of the work of the Scottish Fiscal Commission as an organization and the actual outputs we, uh, we publish. A key objective for the Commission has been to establish its independence from government and ensure that this is seen as credible. We've always acted independently, but perception also matters greatly. When the Commission was first mooted, I was asked to become chair in 2014. I was very helpful to steer towards the OECD's 22 principles for independent fiscal institutions. The principles have remained on my desk ever since, actually in the desk drawer, but they're very close at hand. Independence is key to the Commission's operation, to our efficacy and our credibility. The 22 principles define and guide an institution such as ours as to demonstrate and exemplify its independence. Back in 2019, after two years of operation as a statutory body, we were very pleased to receive an endorsement of our independence. In its peer review of the Commission, the OECD credited us with having quickly developed a reputation for delivering independent and credible forecasts, reflecting in part the quality of our modeling, which had been subjected to their technical assessment. And it credits us with having enriched the fiscal debate in Scotland. The OECD principles also informed our founding legislation, which includes several guarantors of independence, including clear rules on the appointment of commissioners and parliament's, parliament's involvement, uh, a right of access to information that may be held by the Scottish government and its agencies, which we may require to produce our reports, and the power to produce reports on the resources available to the Scottish government whenever we want. We think that the legislation has served us well in establishing an effective fiscal council, and we were encouraged that the OECD reviewers agreed, saying that it could act as a model for others wishing to establish fiscal councils. Now, there's a lot more I could say about the experience of the last seven years, but I'll leave it there. My colleagues and I will be happy to answer any questions that you have for us. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for sorry, your briefing that we've received as well. A couple of questions. First one, um, 
when you were talking about the modelling that you all agreed to use the similar modelling process, how difficult was it to get government departments to buy into that? Because of course in Northern Ireland we have a five party coalition and some departments uh, they, there wouldn't necessarily be that full political buy in. How easy was it for you to be able to achieve everybody to agree to work on the same modelling? Let me be, I think, very clear um, that that my answer is responding to the question you're asking. So um, we, within the Commission, um, actually have created our own models to use um, for all of the, um, both payments, the benefits, and the, uh, the <coughs> forecasting, the fiscal forecasting. So they are our models. What we do is share the basis for those models, and actually we put a huge amount of information about them on our website because we, I, I talked about independence, but not transparency. We're also very transparent. But we share the models, which develop and change over time, with the analysts within government so that they know the basis in which we're looking. But sometimes they will have, and often actually use their own models um, to do a lot of the work that they do along the way uh, as they consider different policy options, as different parties consider policy options. One of the important points in the legislation is that we do not do costings um, uh, or, or look at the potential um, policies of uh, all parties, we will only uh, become involved when we have a, an official policy that is being presented to Parliament. So, um, so that's maybe partly an answer. How did we get all parties to agree? My sense way back then was there was a common agreement uh, or, or a concurrence within the Scottish Parliament that that it, it, after they had done a lot of the kind of research you're doing and looking around at other examples, that um, it, it, they were all behind us uh, coming into being. And we then, over time, developed the way of working and we talked to them and we, we work with them. We've not had um, party particular uh, challenges that have been sustained over the period. Okay. Um, um, sir, next question is, one of the biggest problems, uh, you know, we anticipate, we have a great deal of difficulty here in our own committee about getting um, evidence and getting data and getting reports on time. So how easy have you found it to be able to get information out of government so you can actually do the monitoring and oversight business? And has it been, and I, know, I, I really like the way you talk about transparency. Um, here in Northern Ireland, we say, we probably see just the very top level of sort of what the budgets are and particularly when the outcomes we never get to see behind the detail of it where that is what degree of and i hate using this word and i apologize but what degree of granularity are you getting on the economic data and the budgetary data coming from government um, we, we, I, I will say very little in terms of my colleagues but but we um this evolves over time. I think that's one important uh, point. We learn over time what we need. We work closely with our um, colleagues within the um, Scottish government, but we also, from the very start, developed protocol uh, for working uh, with them. And we have that protocol with individual agencies uh, or teams, and we have that with some of the UK agencies as well. Some of these have been easier to put together, um, and others have been more challenging. Um, they take time sometimes. They take relationship building but we seem to get there. Uh, Claire or John, uh, maybe Claire, you've been involved in a lot of these um, uh, protocols. You want to say something? Yes. So I think we, in working with the Scottish government in terms of getting the data we have, because we have a, a key role at fiscal events in terms of when the budget happens, we're producing the forecasts and we also have to assess the government's borrowing plans. We have a timetable with the government, which is agreed by both parties. There's a process in there which sets out when we will get information, when we request it, and when we will get it. So we put that in place, and we have in the legislation a statutory right of access, although we haven't had to sort of use that, um, test that so far because we have received what we needed. Um, in terms of your question about the level of granularity that we get, I think it's quite an interesting one. So the focus of our work is generally on producing the um, tax and social security forecasts. 
But over the last five years, we have developed our work looking at the whole Scottish budget. And I think you know, we found some of the, some of the challenges you're alluding to um, have, have been challenges in Scotland in terms of the level of transparency around the budget. And because we're playing a role here, we're now starting to ask the questions, we're getting more information, we're putting it out there. We've developed um, part of our report, we've developed what we call a fiscal overview chapter. So we look at the, the budget as a whole. And over the past year, we've developed fiscal updates where we're looking at the Scottish budget and how it's changing. So we've been able to get the information that we think we need to, to do our job and our job has evolved and the, what the parliament asks us for has also evolved. And in terms of what you would potentially get out of a fiscal council, I suppose that depends on what you ask them to do and if you give them the right of access to that information. So if you want them to be able to look at more granular information and publish it, you need to, I suppose, put it in the legislation or make it clear that that is the role of the Fiscal Council. Yeah. And I think, uh, sort of Claire and Susan, you probably already answered my final question I was going to ask before I hand it over to the rest of the committee. As I was saying, how important is it to be on a statutory basis and have legislation that is supported of you? <laughs> um, very. <laughs> um, but the legislation has to be really thoughtful um, you know, it's not good enough just to be there as, you know, by way of statute, but um, what, what the role, what our role is, has, is, is clearly defined, you know, what it is and what it isn't, because that stops us being pulled into uh, political debates that we shouldn't be pulled into if we want to remain independent. Uh, so the, the, the wording and the, the concepts behind the statute itself are really important. John, Claire, you, you agree, I believe, with that notion. Yeah. yeah. Could I just add perhaps one one thing, um, which is sort of relevant to the first question as well, which is um, the other, you know, Claire has already mentioned one important part of the legislation, which is the statutory right of access to information. There's another part which is really important, which is the statutory requirement on the government to use our forecasts um, in setting the budget. So the fact that they have to use our forecasts um, gives us a lot of weight, and it also means that they have a vested interest in, in making un understanding our models because um, part of the forecast is the effect of any policy measures, any variations in taxation or in social security payments, um, and their ministers will have to use our estimates of those costs. So they have, a, they have an incentive to use our models so they can advise ministers on our, our likely um, estimates. So I think that part of the legislation is also tremendously important and it, it, it is really what gives us bite, I think, on the process. Uh, sir, just apologies because I'm not so as familiar with the sort of enabling legislation that set up your council, but sir, when it says the statutory requirement to use our forecast, was that in from the beginning of the... Yes. Uh, that, that that sort of case, yes, it's, it, it's been in the legislation from the beginning. It, it appeared in the legislation very late in the, in the legislative process during the late, at stage three of the passage of the bill um, as, as part of the negotiations between the Scottish Government and the Treasury on fiscal framework. Okay. Thanks very much today. Thanks. Matthew? Thank you, Chair, and thanks um, all very much for coming and giving us evidence. This is really critical, and your experience is really um, useful to us. Just on the point you, just were, you were just talking about, um, the Fiscal Commission was established in June 2014. I was working, on, I was working in the Treasury at the time, so I remember it. Um, but you weren't in established in legislation until, 20, until the Fiscal Commission Act of 2016. Is that right? There was about a two-year interregnum where you didn't have statutory footing? In, in April 2017, so it was closer to three years. The legislation passed in 2016. Um, um, but it, but yeah. it, didn't, it, wasn't, um, it didn't come into force until 17. Yes. Okay. And what were the what differences did you observe between being on a statutory footing once it passed? Did it did, or did it just give you a greater sense of confidence, or did it change the way evolved departments interacted with you? Oh gosh, um, it, it, it made us begin to think about because it wasn't just being on a statutory footing, it was what the requirements would be under that statute. Because as I say, to begin with, there were three devolved taxes and our job was to um, make a pronouncement about the reasonableness of the Scottish government's forecast of those taxes. So relatively simple compared to what 
we do now. The statute that came into effect in April 2017 um, added a good bit to the remit. So we, so it wasn't just being in, on a statutory basis. It was what it was requiring us to do. That led us to um, uh, understand that we needed to appoint um, a, a staff. We needed to have a team of, uh, of you know, highly qualified uh, technical analysts and experts to um, create uh, uh, the the models and um, it, you know it, it led to a lot of steps. But um, again, there you're nodding and you were there at that transition and very much part of the negotiations on it. Yeah, so I was just just to add, I was part of the team supporting Susan in the non-statutory role, and at that point we were scrutinising the Scottish government's forecasts. And we did get full support from the Scottish government. They were transparent about things that we asked for. We didn't we didn't have any difficulties. It's difficult to say if that was because we were about to become a statutory body, but there was there was support from the government there. So I guess in terms of you can operate as a non-statutory body, provided that the government supports that, the reason to be on a statutory footing is to, I suppose, effectively force that government and any future governments to continue to make sure the commission had a role and could act independently. Okay, thank you. And in relation to um, the the independence of your forecasts. A question that we are looking at at the minute is, it's interesting that you do both a full mm -hmm. economic forecast and a fiscal forecast. Do you think it, um, what is, why is it better to do an economic forecast rather than just a fiscal forecast? What, what, does, what advantage does that add? I'll give you my answer, but then I'll turn maybe to John as, as well. We can do a better answer. Um, first of all, up until our inception and, and, and up until the time we got in this, there had really only been, for the most part, two year uh, economic forecasts in Scotland. So, the report on us was to do a five year economic forecast. We were actually filling a gap that, that didn't, uh, you know, that was sitting there that needed to be filled. Um, and uh, so, so, that was something of benefit to the uh, to the government and to the parliament. Yeah. But in addition, um, it, we have responsibility for part of income tax. So it's non-savings, non-dividend uh, income tax uh, paid by Scottish designated taxpayers, and that forecast is very much dependent on some elements of our economic forecast and so it just made sense to fulfill that remit um it was also very helpful that we were doing the economic forecast john do you want to yeah i would just add one more thing so it is it, again it's a it's a feature of the fiscal framework that um in the event of a scotland specific economic shock um which, in other words, the, the Scottish economy is performing less well than the UK economy as a whole. Um, there are additional borrowing powers that the, the Scottish government can access, um, and that that test is, is is partly done on data, but it's also done on our forward-looking forecasts. And um, if you've had a glance at our latest forecast report, you'll see that um, that that truck shock was actually triggered for the first time um, in, in in January this year. So you you basically got you know we use the forecast economic forecasts in in, in forecasting income tax and, and other tax receipts. Um, it's part of the fiscal framework for the Scottish um, Pacific Economic Shock. And also, Susan said, you know, we actually got a, a lot of coverage of our work on the basis of our, our forecasts initially. So it helped us as an institution raise our profile as well. Yeah. The alternative would be, uh, so w it's fair to say that the Scottish Fiscal Commission has a relatively um, uh, sort of maximalist approach or a relatively maximist remit under the fiscal framework to do the, a Scottish equivalent of the OBR EFO, where you're basically doing a full economic and fiscal forecast as opposed to just making a relatively narrow judgment on spending plans? It's um, it's a little bit more limited than the OBR because um, we don't we don't produce, for example, um, forecasts of government expenditure in in, in aggregate. Um, so we're, we're we're only producing the sort of the um, social security payment forecasts, um, devolved taxes forecasts, um, and income tax, and then the the full economic forecast. So it is it is narrower than the, the OBRs. Um, okay. And just in relation to the um, 
uh, the, to go back to the economic forecast point, and then I have one final one after this, Chair. Um, actually, two final ones, but maybe quick. Um, uh, is when it comes to the um, economic forecasting point, it, it, have, has there been any reaction from the kind of economic policy making firmament in Scotland where, for example, ha do they welcome the fact that there is now an official um, independent economic forecaster enshrined in legislation as opposed to just, um, this is not to in any way you know, demean or, uh, or um, undermine the work of academics or, or banks or whatever, but has there been a welcome for that, that there exists a kind of a, 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 an officially mandated independent forecast, economic forecast, I mean? I think you can see you can see the welcome for that in the sense of our news coverage. That um, if you just do do, do um, you know, a very simple sort of look back at um, where our coverage comes from, it's our economic forecasts which get quoted an awful lot. So I think um, you know you, you can just see it in that sort of real preference of, of people that you know if they want to find an economic forecast for Scotland. Um, they tend to go to us um, because we produce these forecasts, um, which are on a five-year basis, which is longer term than most people, other people in Scotland forecast, and we do some of ours on a, a pretty regular basis as well. Uh, and do you um, do you do forecast evaluations? Yes. Yes. <laughs> we all say simultaneously yes. And, and but the, my, my next question is going to be an obvious one. How, how do you do? <laughs> <laughs> As well, spoke as the ex Treasury yeah. official. <laughs> I, mean, I suppose twenty twenty is obviously a different. It's a difficult year, but but you know how has how have you broadly done in terms of your from your perspective? I'll let my colleagues give me detail. I just want to say one thing that it um, took quite a while in talking. Um, to a lot of our key stakeholders who are very interested in our work, but not necessarily with a strict economics background to understand that when we talk about forecast error, that's a technical term in, in economic forecasting. And it doesn't mean we didn't add two plus two correctly. So um, I just will, will share that with you. You can share that amongst your parliamentary colleagues as well. Okay. Um, but, but with our forecast evaluations, we go through painstakingly all of the differences, all of the reasons we discuss these at committee in Parliament, we're challenged about them, um, and we then use those differences to go back and uh, refine and improve the forecasts uh, in the future. We haven't yet um, evaluated the most recent forecasts because they're quite quite recent and, and we need uh, you know a few months to do that so um, you know probably early autumn we'll have something back in the more recent forecast but uh, for more granular answer to that John or Claire okay. perhaps I'll, oh, yeah, sorry. I'll, I'll say a little bit to begin with and, and they can Claire can pick up as well um, I think it's quite a difficult question to answer because we haven't been doing forecasts for that long so we have a relatively small number of forecasts under our belt and we've also um, had a fair number of data problems as well. And also we're forecasting some, some very new stuff. Um, and Claire in particular can perhaps add something on social security payments there. But I think it's fair to say that when, when things settle down, we're roughly within the same sort of um, limits as the, the OBR forecasts. Um, where there have been particular issues, I think, have been around income tax when we were actually forecasting for, for a while without having proper outturn data on Scotland. So we were making an estimate of the of of, of the outturns um, from an imperfect survey, and HMRC um, didn't actually produce any any outturn data for um, a, a year or so. So I think that 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 caused more difficulties. Um, but I'd say in broad terms, we're getting towards OBR sort of tolerance. Okay. Um, but perhaps Claire should add a little bit thereon. Well, final, final, final question. I will keep it limited. You are the, 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 the obvious example for us of a subnational fiscal institution inside the UK. So we're obviously um, going to be looking to you. One, have you had has the Department of Finance here asked for your input in developing their plans around our independent fiscal institutions? And two, if you if they they haven't asked you, what would be the the top one or two tips you would give them? What's absolutely essential to be successful for a, a, a subnational? Uh, independent fiscal institution in the context of a devolved UK? So I, I had a conversation with someone who I think has been involved, uh, you know, from the civil service from, from Northern Ireland, involved in, in pulling this together. So I would say at least in my and John or Claire, I don't know if you were contacted as well, but yeah. Okay. So the answer is yes. 
um, they have done. Uh, and why don't you both go with your one or two tips? I think I know what mine are, but uh, Claire, what would your couple of tips be? I think I'd probably be clear what you want the organization to do in the legislation, but also make sure that the organization has the power to comment on any fiscal matter. I think that's one of the things which has been has given us the most scope in terms of expanding our work into areas that both we and also the Finance Committee in the Scottish Parliament have subsequently thought are important for us to look at. So that would be my top tip. Thank you. John? I think Claire's had all said everything I would say. Yeah, and I'd, I'd agree um, with that. And um, above all, as you shape your legislation, the only thing I would add is think very carefully about unintended consequences of any statements in that legislation in relation to... Oh, Susan, we need to hear this. <laughs> we need to hear this. You just froze out there. Uh -oh. But, well, I'll give you an example, um, which is um, funding. Um, there have been fiscal councils elsewhere in the world where their funding has been tempered with, if you will, tempered, played with, because they had annual funding promises. And it's very hard for assemblies and for parliaments to give multi-year funding promises, but we found a way to get out at least a three-year look ahead for our funding needs. And that means that that gives us more freedom to speak up now because we know we won't be put out of business tomorrow because of the, the budget won't be taken away. So it's things like that that you can enshrine in legislation that will make it all more smooth when you get going. Okay, thanks. So, Jim? Which one, Claire, or do you uh, no. think, Jim? Uh, th thanks for your evidence. Um, it's pretty clear that the catalyst for the appointment of the Scottish Commission was the transfer of tax raising powers to Edinburgh, and does it therefore follow that without at least significant tax raising powers, there is a limited, if any, role for a fiscal commission? <laughs> My response would be that, that it can be what you make of it. Um, if I look at fiscal councils and commissions, um, around the world. So the OECD has a network of, of all these organizations and, um, and, and one gets to observe and know and interact with them over the time. Um, so many of them are different. So there was no model like ours when we were formed. Um, and uh, that's true of others as well. If you value um, an, an independent, sort of dispassionate, evidence-based view of whatever aspect of your budget setting process, then I think there's a place and a role for a fiscal council. But is the key component or work of a fiscal council stroke commission not to assess uh, how the taxes raised are being efficiently or otherwise spent? If you're not raising taxes, how do you do that? <coughs> Claire, go ahead. I can just add a little bit in terms of our work. So the primary role that we're playing is looking at tax and social security um, forecasting. But we've also have been expanding our work on public funding. And one of the challenges that we had here was when we first started producing our forecast, people just said, OK, but that's great. But what does it mean for the whole Scottish budget? How does it fit in? And I think part, part of our role here has been trying to explain how the Scottish government is funded, what's coming from the UK, what's variable, how much certainty the Scottish government can have over that funding. And then that has played into our commentary on the Scottish government's choices in terms of what it does in, in its use of reserves and what it does in terms of borrowing. And that's not about us saying the Scottish government should be doing this or they should be doing that, but it's about adding transparency um, to the decisions the government are making and I suppose being clear about what's happening so that parliamentarians such as yourself can then, I suppose, challenge the government on those questions. Do, do you distinguish between a fiscal council and a fiscal commission? Because we've been um, given both, neither of them yet on a statutory basis, uh, and yet we have no tax raising powers. Do you make a distinction between the two? 
So in terms of internationally, uh, I think council is a more common word that is used in terms of a fiscal council as an independent fiscal institution. So internationally, we would be known as a fiscal council. Um, it's just the name of our organization is a fiscal commission. Um, and the fiscal commission, which you have in Northern Ireland, is similar to what we had in Scotland in terms of the Smith Commission, which is playing quite a different role. So we're, we're not playing the fiscal commission role that in Northern Ireland. Um, it's more of a, it's the fiscal council role, albeit with a, a different remit. So one is more forming and one is then carrying out. Yeah. Uh, in terms of um, analysing tax take, obviously it's more academic than real here, but I understand from reading some of your material that you've had difficulties coming to a view on the tax on the VAT tax take in Scotland. Mm. Could you say a word to us about that? Perhaps um, I could answer that. Um, that there is no data on um, how much VAT is collected in Scotland. So in order for um, receipts from tax to be sort of part of the Scottish government's budget, um, there had to be some sort of um, assignment model which um, HMRC had built um, and then, in a sense, it then became a political issue between the government, the Scottish government, and the Treasury about sort of whether they would actually assign the revenue from that model to to the Scottish budget. And it was decided to not to do that um, until the fiscal framework review. Um, so the difficulty was basically is, um, a, a tax which was assigned without an, any data or any hope of actually getting real data. So it has to be model driven. So is that just an impasse now, or? Um, I think that's that, that that's one for, for both the Treasury and the Scottish Government to decide. Yeah. You also were given social security powers in Scotland. Mm -hmm. But of course with that came the cost to Scotland of administering social security. Mm -hmm. Isn't that correct? Yes. Whereas in Northern Ireland we do not have social security powers, but it also means that we don't have to pick up any of what must be the very substantial administrative costs. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> so can you give us an indication of what are the administrative costs of Social Security in Scotland? So herein lies one of those um, constraints around what our remit is, and it's very important to, as I said before, that these are clear. Um, so we do not, uh, for instance, forecast uh, how much Social Security Scotland, the new agency in Scotland, Oh dear. You know, that kind of thing. That isn't the job. The job is to um, help the Parliament understand um, through for forecasting what's the likely cost of the individual benefits that are devolved. So it's not the cost of Social Security in the whole, it's of the actual benefits in relation to recipients. But you do have to bear in Scotland the administration costs of Social Security. Mm -hmm. Can you identify at all what they are? That would be a question, really, for the Scottish government. So we we only we only look at the, the as soon as said on the benefit payments. We only, whereas the Scottish government manages their administration costs themselves effectively because those are not so demand led, um, in comparison to the payments which actually go out the door. There was some provision in the fiscal framework for the Scottish government to receive some money from Treasury, although I, I suspect it does not cover the full amount. But I'm afraid the Scottish government would need to tell you the costs of administering their system. It's not one that we could answer today. And what does the Scottish Fiscal Commission or Council, what does it cost? John, you're the budget holder. I can't um, I don't have the exact figure on, 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 on the top of mine, but it's, it's, it's just a little bit um, short of £2 million a year. Thank you. But I, I, can, I can certainly send the clerk so that the, the exact figure, if that would be helpful. Okay. Thanks very much indeed. Jim? You can always rely upon clever Jim to ask some really tough questions, and those certainly were. Mine, I don't think, will be anything like that. But um, you're bound to be asked this question as to the economic impact of uh, Scotland becoming independent. And I think I've noticed you got your retaliation in quickly to say that you take no position whatsoever 
on either pro or anti independence. But surely your staff have been asked to do projections as to the likely impact on the Scottish budget of any decision, or is that totally taboo as far as your staff are concerned and your remit? Um, so that's a complicated uh, area. As I said before, our remit is to do policy costings on policies that are going to Parliament that are form uh, costings on speculative policies. Uh, but we have been discussing as uh, as and when conversations may be developed Scotland on this um, where we might have a role, uh, it, but we're, we're, we're looking at that space. But but um, up till now, that isn't within what we are, um, you know, told we can do. But, but surely, if you can't, if it isn't even possible to identify the VAT that would be apportioned to the Scottish budget, are there not severe limitations placed upon you about projecting the overall impact? of, of um, an independent Scotland? Well, right now we are not forecasting the overall you know, economic impact of an independent Scotland. There may be elements that would develop over time in relation to that situation that may be brought forward as potential policy. We may need to think about how one of the things we do is to try to enrich the debate um, to the extent we can on important matters. So there may be areas that we would uh, explore, um, but um, it, our, our remit is not for everything. So uh, in Scotland, and maybe it's important to say that, for instance, we don't uh, have anything to do with the cost of the NHS in Scotland. That's uh, that is completely separate from uh, what our remit is. So we're not looking at absolutely everything all the time, but increasingly we're looking overall at um, the sort of the, as Claire said, what goes into the Scottish budget and how that plays out over a year and what changes are happening. Very important this last year with all of the uh, extra COVID-related funding. Well, well, here, health service funding is 51 per cent of the entire block grant, and I'm sure in mm -hmm. Scotland it must also be by far and away the largest element of expenditure, and it is a devolved issue, of course, in Scotland. So how on earth can any of your projections be viable or, or valid if you're not allowed to take into account the biggest single expenditure line in the entire budget? Maybe I'm not explaining this properly because we are forecasting in, in certain buckets, if you will, um, of taxes and benefits and, and, and so forth. We're not forecasting that overall piece. Um, that's not within what we do. And, and that's constrained by the legislation that put us into statute and, and tells us what to do. That's, you know, that's the power that lies in, in your hands as you put your um, body together. Give it some powers, John. You can maybe explain this better than me. Um, perhaps I'll just, just take it from a slightly different um, perspective. That when when the Scottish government sets a budget, um, it, it does that, um, or perhaps when they think about their medium-term financial strategies, they did in January. They think of the next next five years under the current constitutional settlement, and so they'll they'll. They'll, they'll, they'll think about the, the likely size of the block grant um, and they can use OBR forecasts to help them do that. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll provide them with income tax forecasts, other tax forecasts and social security payment forecasts. And then because the, the Scottish budget has to balance, all, all the arithmetic then works out very straightforwardly. Um, and we'll come in at the very end to just look at the, the implied borrowing. So, you know, to the extent to which they can sort of move small amounts of money between fiscal years and they can borrow small amounts, we will judge the reasonableness of that. So, in a sense, you, you, you have to think about sort of how, they, how the, the budget works under the current constitutional arrangements and our place in that. So, thinking about independence and its impact on the health budget does, doesn't sort of impact upon how that, that budget is currently set. Certainly, if we were setting up a similar budget, we would definitely have to take in health would have to be central and core of it because it's such a major part of what we do. But just a final question. Um, if, as a result of your work, you're absolutely convinced that the Minister of Finance in Scotland is doing something that's frankly reckless 
are completely out of uh, any sensible understanding of budgetary control. What can you do? Um, we, uh, with all of our reports, and um, or, or near the time of publication of all of our reports, but also at any other time, um, we can be called to give evidence to parliamentary committees. There's the Finance and Constitution Committee, um, there's the Social Security Committee, and occasionally we've sp spoken to the Economics, it has a long name, uh, <laughs> committee as well. Um, and so parliamentarians... Um, own that space in a sense to know what's going on and to, to, to be informed. They can speak to us and we go in using evidence uh, in a dispassionate way to uh, share the information that we can. Um, our job isn't to judge the performance of uh, a given uh, minister or a given department. That's not uh, in the space that we, uh, that we operate. Um, but we can certainly be, you know, very, very public. I mean, everything we do is public. It's on record. Literally everything. So, so for instance, for instance, take a, a, a totally arbitrary example. Say there was a renewable heating scheme in Scotland, <laughs> which was clearly rapidly running out of control and would build up a 600 million pound, I mean, this is all mythical, of course, but a 600 million pound debt would have to be borne by the Scottish taxpayer. You're saying that all you can do is to give evidence to the, in this case would be our economic committee, our department of the economy committee. You, you have no power to intervene. You just can give evidence to the appropriate me, uh, committee at Hollywood. We wouldn't intervene as the policy was being developed to say we don't think that's a good idea. Do it this way. Um, but we, uh, in terms of looking at the, for instance. Let me backtrack for a minute. John said something that was very important a minute ago, which is that by law, the Scottish government has to have a, a balanced budget. Um, so that's a constraint on it. And we need to look, and they have some borrowing powers, and we need to comment on um, those borrowing powers and, you know, it, 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 overall, or reasonable. So there are routes in to make comment about uh, something that looks as if it would topple the castle, as it were, uh, if it was really extreme. There are ways to do that. Claire or John? I was going to say... I, I, I think the... Sorry, Claire, go on. I was just going to say, I suppose the main, the main role a fiscal council can play here is, is, to, is to be a voice. If there, if there are risks to the budget, we have not had any in Scotland that we've highlighted in, in such a way as, you, as you've have you said. But there are certain aspects of the fiscal framework which have um, fiscal consequences for the Scottish Government, and we have highlighted those. And when we do a sort of press release at a budget time, we can get news coverage from that. So it's, if a fiscal council has, I suppose, it's, it's, as a, a fiscal watchdog, it's, it's the bark of the fiscal watchdog that can play quite an important role in signaling these things. And then it's, I suppose, up to the public, the media, parliamentarians to, to get the government to change if they think so. And the fiscal council is just there, I suppose, to raise awareness of those issues rather than to dictate what happens. Thanks very much, Lee. Pat? Thanks, Chair. Thanks, John and Susan and Claire. I just have a few wee points. Um, Claire, or sorry, Susan, earlier on you said you have rules for the appointment of commissioners. Um, you stated that whenever uh, I was trying to figure out the working of those rules, so as you can have that independence. I mean, I mean, the follow-on question is the benefits, you know, of the fiscal council and the governance of it for Northern Ireland for the executives. But as well as that. Just to add into it, so it's like three together. The legislation which established uh, your fiscal commission in Scotland, the most important, sure, it fulfils its functions. Which of these do you think is the independent fiscal council for Northern Ireland should copy? Taking in mind the thread that runs through my question is, how do we, as ordinary members of the of the assembly here, have that say and that control for who is appointed? So um, the, the, I have the, the 
questionable, I don't know, um, uh, badge of being the first individual under the Scottish par par Parliament whose appointment was made by our public appointments you know, through a minister, um, carried through the Public Appointments Commission, but also my appointment and then my two initial fellow commissioners and everyone since um, by the Scottish Parliament. And from the very start, and I have to say right at the very beginning, even before we went on statute, there were times when I would say to people, um, we answer to the Parliament of Scotland because they had to approve, they debated. Um, it's very odd to be personally debated by parliamentarians, but that was done. Um, and any new commissioner uh, has to have a hearing, if you will, in front of the Finance Committee and be asked questions about their background and and, you know, whatever questions uh, the individuals want to ask them. And then the parliament approves the appointments uh, in addition. So the appointments are recommended through the ministerial route, ultimately approved by parliament. So that gives you a lot of say uh, on that. And of course, there is, you know, restraints. Um, it, we wouldn't have um, sitting um, uh, pe people within the government come to do this really there are various obvious restraints but that role of the Scottish of the Scottish Parliament in approving our appointments and taking that process seriously um, by interview and by debate on the chamber's floor um, is a way they have taken hold of that does that answer your question well some of it I couldn't really hear very well simply because of the sound but I understand to send uh, I think I get what you're trying to say there, but then what are what again? I'd ask you for the legislation itself. Uh, which of these uh, of the end of, for, which of the legislation, the establishment of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, which are the most important, and ensuring that you can fulfil your functions? Which of these do you think is the most important Fiscal Council for Northern Ireland should copy? Which of those rules, which of those benefits, which of those is set out from the very start are we able to copy on? Taking in mind what I've said, I feel like as an ordinary member uh, of the Assembly here that I would have no part to play in that or I wouldn't be able to check it. And I don't know what it's like in Scotland, but it's so difficult here to get the documents when we try to get them here in order to get into the meat of something. So you've already stated there that as you put it out at the start, and the powers that you have there, and you're fulfilling your functions, how can we police that? And can that be policed as just by an ordinary assembly member, not necessarily by our executive? That's what that's what I'm trying to get to. You're asking the Ronalds to are clear, perhaps to respond, but I think you're asking an important question, uh, absolutely. Uh, it, but I think the idea that that the commissioners who are ultimately responsible, as I said in my opening comments, for the forecasts uh, that are published, we have personal responsibility for those. It's also in, in our, 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 you know, our, enabling uh, conversation um, and we report to the parliament so we're held personally accountable by the parliament uh, and that accountability is um, uh, carried out through evidence sessions uh, at the various committees and and if we're asked we go I mean it's not like we can't say oh, we don't feel like that absolutely you know the parliament is is um, the body to whom we owe our allegiance. And that means that it's really the people of Scotland. That is what helps us keep independence. Um, but John, you know, one element you might come at slightly differently. Just to add in terms of the legislation and the things that I think are, are help a, a fiscal council play a really important role so one one part of our legislation is that we we are i suppose a key part of the budget process because our forecasts have to be used now there, there may be other ways of doing that in northern ireland that are more appropriate but because the government is required to use our forecasts we are required to be part of the budget process which means we have to have the information in order for the budget to take place so that kind of i suppose gives us a slight sort of more power or more influence or more opportunity to ask 
The other one is the statutory right of access to information, which is incredibly important. And that I suppose that that's something that a fiscal council absolutely should have. That's a key OECD principle. Um, and the other one is, I think, giving the fiscal council the opportunity, the power to comment on anything. So not you need to be clear in the legislation what their role is, but also give them scope to comment on other things. And sorry, I suppose I thought, <laughs> add another one is also we are required to publish all of our reports, and that includes our, fiscal, our forecast accuracy reports, that includes our main forecasts, any other papers, and we are required to lay, as we lay them in Parliament, so Parliament absolutely gets access to everything that we publish. So those are, I suppose, my key things from our legislation. And just to add in terms of how you appoint um, members, our, Susan set out our appointments process, but internationally in some other countries, um, some members of fiscal councils are directly appointed by the parliament and some are directly appointed by the executive. So there are different ways internationally, different models internationally for how you appoint council members that may be more appropriate um, in the Northern Irish context. John, I don't know if you want to add anything else. I, I would add something which isn't part of the the statute, but it's part of the operation of the Scottish Parliament, that when we go to give evidence to the Finance Committee, um, I don't think any of us look forward to it. Um, and the, the quality of the questions is, is, is pretty high, and there are certainly times when I felt very, very uncomfortable. So I think it's, it, it's also down to you know, how, the, how the Assembly and, the, the, and you guys in the Finance Committee, people in the Finance Committee, um, actually interrogate the Fiscal Council as well. Um, and if you make their life uncomfortable by asking tough questions, I think that's really an important part of the process. Okay, thanks very much indeed for that. Uh, Maisha? In fact, I think that my question uh, has been answered as well, too. Just, uh, hello, can you hear me, Chair? Yes, we can, Alicia. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, I can. I, uh, in fact, the question that I intend to ask is which aspect of the legislation, you know, and established the Fiscal Council, will you regard as sort of vital, uh, even in the case of Northern Ireland, uh, that uh, they should sort of deploy uh, in this respect? So. Okay, thanks very much, Alicia. Um, just, just before you go, uh, Susan, and uh, thank you very much indeed for your evidence, but I've just got three short questions and I'm not going to prolong them um, because you can tell by the questions we're being asked, you've, there is a lot of really good work that you've done that we need to mirror. Um, first question is, how important is it for the likes of OECD to be checking your homework, for want of better terminology? We have an issue here in Northern Ireland with public sector reform that OECD made a recommendation for, but haven't been invited back to check the progress. So first of all, how is it important to have that external validation? Uh, the second question is, when I looked at your data sets, we in Northern Ireland, uh, one of our departments says it has a great deal of difficulty getting information out of HMRC, but it seems from your data table that a, a lot of your issues with HMRC have been resolved with the exception of the VAT issue. But all the other things seem to be resolved and they're not highlighted as particular issues. Uh, just a short answer than that. And the final one is, you know, what extra capacity could you have to, let's say, shadow a nascent Northern Ireland Fiscal uh, Council and to be able to sort of provide that support as uh, whatever we come to here gets up and running and sort of uh, manages to deliver? Uh, so three good questions, very quick answers. Um, I think, and we all share this view, it's important for anybody, especially a body you know, so closely aligned to the public interest, to have it vetted. Um, built into our legislation, and horrifying at the beginning was that we would have an external peer review after two years of operating under statute. I thought, oh my goodness, you know, we'd barely be up and running. Um, I thought it was terrific that, that that happened after two years because it was early enough we could see what was being commented um, and recommended and we could, we could uh, shift and adjust if we wanted to. Um, these reviews can be done in various ways, but our experience, and I think increasingly the experience of many fiscal councils, is that the OECD have um, a reputation and expertise, um, the, the, the people resources, the intellectual resources, 
to carry out all of these reviews. So it isn't that we have to have OECD to it, but in our judgment, and we looked further afield, we felt that they were the best body to do that review for us. Um, and they bring along some peers from other councils. So that's very helpful in terms of both vetting what we do, but also you know, making suggestions. It's a, it's, a, it's a good learning time for everybody. So, so review is really important. Um, that's number one. Number two, I'm right there right out of my head now. Um, what was the, the second question was? Uh, the second question was uh, about HMRC. Uh, one, of our one of our departments here has complained about not getting data out of HMRC, but when yeah. I look at your data so, tables, you seem to manage to do it quite effectively. Well, it, all I want to say in general is that we've been in operation for uh, you know several years now, and we've been working with the big um, UK agencies who have to provide us data for several years and it's it's sometimes it's hard for them um, because they're now doing a different run of data maybe looking at things differently maybe a different timetable um, for a subnational uh, fiscal council or institution they need to adapt we need to work with them it's about building relationships about explaining what it is you need when you think you need it understanding the challenges they have but also being pretty open and and I was public about one agency, not a MRC, um, at a at our at a finance committee when we really had difficulties getting data. Um, it's just working through the issue. So it doesn't happen automatically. You have to work at it. But work at it I suggest the sense of going to say, here's what we need, what can you do? Where is the gap and how can we bridge that gap? Um, so that, that's what I would uh, would do there. Um, is there anything else on that? Um, just the final, just the final one was: uh, Could you shadow our organisation? Do you have the capacity to do that? Um, you're a chief executive, so the staff will follow up with you. What do you think? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't pick that up, Susan. So I. Uh, oh. Can you hear me? Um, I was turning to John as the chief executive All right. uh, to see if he had a view on Yeah. I think we're, we're in a position to sort of be, be, be helpful and friendly. Um, I think um, we're not resourced in a sense to formally shadow people, but um, we've certainly received an awful lot of help in, in the past from people like the OBR. Um, and I think we see it as part of our sort of um, function to sort of repay that debt. So we have some capacity, but not, but not not, not, not do anything formal. Okay. Um, sorry, Susan John Clare, thank you very much indeed. Uh, would you be happy to continue a dialogue with us as we develop along this journey? Because I think, uh, just looking around, uh, sort of my the, the group of us here, I think we would be very interested to keep on communicating because there's lots of ideas that we'll need to continue to explore as we bring this to fruition. Hopefully. Uh, the answer, and I know I speak for my colleagues, absolutely. Um, we would do that. Um, it's in your interest and in all our interests that you get set up the best way possible, and we're very happy to continue an engagement. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. And I apologise for the poor communications, but uh, be safe. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. And can we take Susan, John, and Claire off spotlight, Stephen? And if we move on to the next evidence session, uh, it's with NICFA and the Ulster University, Fiscal Powers for Northern Ireland. We received uh, oral evidence from uh, Seamus McAlevey, who we all know, and Dr Esmond Burney, who we know as well. Uh, the session has been recorded by Hansard. <coughs> Stephen, can you bring Seamus and Esmond on, please? There. Hi, Seamus. Good to see you again. Hi, Steve. Can you hear can me? Hear? Yeah. yeah, I can hear you fine. Yeah. Esmond, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, excellent. That's, that's, that's good. It's good to see you again. Uh, I just want to say that the session has been recorded by Hansard. Uh, the briefing note team is on page 157. Uh, the covering information from NICFA is page 161. Uh, an updated discussion on the PwC report from uh, Dr. Burney is at page 162. A copy of the 2013 report commissioned by NICFA is at page 168. And a copy of the Minister's statement on the 12th of February 2021, including information on the Fiscal Commission, is at page 224. Uh, I don't know who wants to go first, but uh, please, uh, over to you. 
Yeah, maybe if I chaired a brief introduction and pass over to Esmond Lane, uh, just in terms of setting the context of this, uh, we commissioned this piece of work from PwC. Uh, Esmond was the person who carried out and was the author of the report. It was part of a wider range of research reports that we carried out, generally commissioned uh, from other experts. And quite often what we were trying to do uh, was find policy differences that might improve the situation in Northern Ireland with regard to the economy. We quite often didn't have a fixed view going into it. We weren't trying to find the evidence to prove something, but very much we were about trying to inform ourselves in the voluntary community sector and inform the debate at large uh, in Northern Ireland. And you'll remember back at this, at this time, the whole focus uh, was around the devolution of corporation tax powers and, you know, should we reduce them and all of that. We, like everybody else, were taxed thinking about, about that issue. And uh, our attitude in general was we were willing to explore anything that might make a reasonable difference. Uh, and the main thing for us was trying to get the evidence before any of us would make decisions for or against. Uh, so that's what we were doing in commissioning this. Uh, re report, and I'll pass over to Esmond. Okay, okay. thank you very much, Seamus. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thanks for for having us, as it were. Uh, first of all, can I make some remarks by way of context? I think there are three main arguments for saying that uh, Stormont should um, use, to a greater extent, either the fiscal powers it has or think about extending them three arguments. First of all, an accountability argument. In other words, there should be some sort of stronger connection between uh, decisions about spending more money on whatever type of policy and how you fund, how you raise the revenue. So there's the accountability argument. Secondly, there's an argument about incentives. Taxes and charges can either be raised or lowered according to whether you want to either encourage or discourage a type of behaviour or a type of economic or social action which you either think is good or bad for society. And a third uh, reason for considering fiscal powers and the use of them is that the likelihood post-COVID, the rest of this decade in other words, the block grant coming into Northern Ireland, which is, makes up the bulk of the funding for the Assembly and the Executive, the growth of that is going to be limited at the UK-wide level, and hence the so-called Barnet consequentials and the read across to Northern Ireland Limited. Therefore, to some extent, you're going to be more have to be more reliant on, as it were, Northern Ireland's own fiscal resources. I'm not arguing, and the report back in 2013 didn't argue that fiscal powers were some sort of miracle cure for the economy, but it's something that might be helpful in giving more options and levers to policymakers. It's not about an agenda of simply cutting all taxes or indeed the reverse, increasing all taxes. I think you need to look at it on a tax by tax basis, case by case or charge by charge basis. And anything um, the report is saying is in no way denying the importance of value for money. In other words, getting as much effectiveness and efficiency out of the spending we have. And just a few other remarks before I, I shut up and, and we move to the questions and answers. Um, comparisons with Scotland and Wales, of course, you, you've already had a session there with the Scottish Fiscal Commission. I think what's interesting is that back in 1999, in, as it were, the most recent or current period of devolution, the two other devolved assemblies in the UK had weaker or more limited fiscal powers than the Northern Ireland Assembly. They've sort of leapfrogged over the Assembly, they, they now have a wider range of powers in Scotland, land buildings, transactions tax, landfill tax, and most of the issues around earned income tax. Wales, the powers are broadly similar, but less extensive with respect to income tax. In terms of broad principles for fiscal devolution, as it were, I'll mention three. 
First of all, you should attempt to keep your tax base as wide as possible, and hence you can keep the rates of each tax as low as possible. Now, I say this because I think the evidence of the record and de of devolution in North Island hitherto has been that the Assembly has gone in the opposite direction by, for example, extending wider and wider reliefs, for example, with respect to non-domestic rating. Second broad principle is if you do wish to promote accountability, you would be thinking about the devolution of the bigger taxes. But in a moment, I'll say there are certain problems about at least two of the three really big taxes in terms of uh, the scale of revenue raised. And a third and last broad point is back to the question of using taxes and charges to either incentivize or disincentivize behavior. There's a lot of scope for doing that, a lot of scope for doing it at the devolved level. The Assembly has already moved into that territory, for example, in terms of the plastic bags tax. Uh, there will be more environmental related taxing in the future. There, there can be no doubt about that. Okay, now, uh, let me move on very quickly to say a little bit about which particular taxes and charges might get the greatest attention. And I'm going to start with domestic water charges. Why do I start there? Because it's feasible, it certainly could be done. And also because the amount of revenue being foregone up to £280 million per annum is by far probably the largest area of, as it were, revenue raising, which at the moment uh, Stormont is um, excluding itself from. Now, it is often said that we should not have domestic water charges because it would be damaging to low-income households, but there would be ways of managing that in terms of means testing, for example, as was proposed back in 2007 in terms of the Hilliard report at that time. And also, the current position is itself inequitable because that £280 million is taken out of the North Island Block Grant to subsidise North Island Water to cover its operating subsidy. That is money that is not available for, for example, school, for health service, employment and industrial generation and so forth, all areas that would probably benefit lower income groups. So I think the status quo is the inequitable situation rather than moving towards domestic water charges. It's also sometimes argued that we already pay for our water in the form of our rates. That is an unconvincing argument because if you look at uh, the combination of uh, council tax in Great Britain alongside water charges, the totality of that is much higher than the uh, level of rates payment on average here in Northern Ireland. And that leads on to looking at domestic rates. Our level uh, in Northern Ireland, on average, approximately half that in England and Wales. Bear in mind that Wales is very similar socioeconomic characteristics to Northern Ireland. That is a situation which is hard to either explain or defend. And in fact, that points to the wider issue of so-called super parity, that in so many regards, charging in Northern Ireland is at a much lower level than uh, the counterpart position in Great Britain. Now, I, I keep talking about big taxes, big taxes in terms of the total amount of revenue raised. The three biggest taxes in terms of revenue raised or apportioned, going back to the Fiscal Commission's discussion earlier in North Island, are income tax, value added tax and national insurance contribution. It would, in fact, be very difficult, probably impossible to devolve national insurance contribution and value added tax. Uh, I can explain that if you wish, but it's basically to do with um, the integration of North Island's welfare system with the rest of the UK and with respect to VAT. It's because and I think North Island is still subject to European Union single market competition law. Uh, that excludes sub-regional variations in value-added tax. Income tax, now, it's certainly there's a feasibility to devolve this because it has already happened in Scotland and in Wales. But I think the Assembly does have to ask itself very carefully in advance of pushing for the power 
what would you do with the power? Because there are options, indeed there are dilemmas, and there are trade-offs. If you were aiming for greater equality of outcome, you would presumably wish to raise the 40% rate of tax and indeed the 45% rate of tax, as indeed has been done in Scotland by one percentage point. But there is some evidence based on, for example, American experience and UK experience that if you raise the top rates of income tax, the actual amounts, additional amounts of revenue raised can sometimes be disappointing because high income earners have various means, as it were, to uh, change their behaviour to avoid paying much of the extra tax. And of course, at the sub-regional level, the most extreme form of behaviour that could be adopted is simply to, to move from Northern Ireland, to either move from Northern Ireland to Great Britain or indeed to the Republic of Ireland in order to enjoy a lower top rate of tax. Now, an alternative approach to income tax might actually be to cut the higher rates if you favour the promotion of entrepreneurship. But you can see here immediately the dilemma. Do you raise or do you lower the uh, top rate? And I would also say to you, if the Assembly is aiming to raise revenues from income tax, serious consideration would have to be given to increasing um, for many people who currently pay the basic rate of 20%, increasing the amount of tax they pay. Now, of course, that may well be a strategy you do not wish to adopt, but it is interesting, a strategy which to some extent the Scottish Parliament, Scottish Government have adopted. Now, very quickly, a air passenger duty, argument there for its devolution in its entirety at the moment it's only the long-haul flights that are included and of course uh, for several years now we haven't had any long-haul flights in any case but of course there are negative environmental considerations although i would stress apd was never a well-designed tax from the point of view of reducing carbon stamp duty uh, it can certainly be devolved. It's, it has been so in Wales and in Scotland. But you do need to think very carefully about the consequences. If, for example, you cut the duty in order to promote uh, particularly purchases by uh, lower income and first-time buyers and so forth, which might seem highly desirable, you might simply uh, fuel a increased level of demand in the property market and prices would rise and the benefits would, in a sense, be compensated out. The, 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 there wouldn't be any benefits or not much. Landfill tax, again, it could be devolved. You could raise the amount, the amount paid per tonne in order to discourage landfill. Uh, you would need to think about negative consequences, possibly in terms of any incentivization towards illegal export of waste to the Republic of Ireland. And I'll finish with corporation tax. It's an interesting one because the Assembly does already have the power since 2016 to cut it to vary from the UK average rate. That power is not being used. It is subject to um, having an overall fiscal balance and sustainability. Uh, I think the plans announced at the recent UK budget, the March budget by Chancellor Sunak to raise the UK rate to 25% does put a somewhat new perspective on this, as does the proposals to raise the United States federal corporation tax rate to 28%. There may be an argument for Northern Ireland, uh, as it were, not following or tracking the increase of the UK rate in 2023, but there would be a cost to that in terms of the block grant. So thanks very much. I've, I've spoken too long there already. I'm sure uh, there is a need for public debate in all these areas. That's why uh, the creation of the Fiscal Commission, led by Paul Johnson, to consider this is very welcome. It's, it will be the first time that North Ireland will have had an independent and comprehensive um, consideration of these issues. And indeed, the role of this committee is strategic and vital in the context of such a debate. But again, thank you very much. Yeah. Seamus Esben, as usual, sort of excellent evidence, and thanks very much indeed. Um, so I've just got a couple of questions before I open up to the team. But um, look, one of the key issues to this is before we start looking at sort of uh, revenue raising uh, requirements and the rest of it, 
Um, how would you assess our ability to spend the money we actually have efficiently? If you were going to mark our own homework and how we do it now. Well, I, Chair, I'll start very briefly. I'm sure Seamus will, will, yeah. will have a view on this too. Um, it's, it's obviously not the same issue as the one you've, you've asked uh, uh, me to talk about and indeed the report uh, covered, but there, there are questions of concern. I don't think that could be denied. And it was interesting. I think it may have been you yourself, Chair, the previous uh, session with the uh, Scottish uh, Commission, you did refer to that OECD report on governance yeah. um, in, in Northern Ireland in 2016, uh, and they were uh, attempting to address some of those issues. And as you say, uh, it's not entirely clear how far uh, change was uh, brought into effect since 2016, and obviously we've since had um, coming to light uh, in terms of the inquiry, the RHI. So there, there are issues around effectiveness and efficiency of public spending. But if, as it were, even allowing for all that, I still think there is some argument for uh, fiscal variation. And there may even be a sense in which, if Storwood, to a greater extent, had to raise to a greater extent, its own revenues, that in itself would incentivise more care in the use of the money it has. Okay. Yeah, you had a... I could Sorry, go ahead, on that, Chair. Uh, I mean, I think there is a, an issue here, and we've particularly seen it over the last six years or so in terms of annual budgets in Northern Ireland. Uh, we haven't prioritised for a whole variety of reasons. We we haven't prioritised our spending, I think, very well. One of the things that concerns me is that I think we degraded all services equally. And when things are tight under you know the pressure that we've had during austerity, I think it would have been much better if we uh, had a strong uh, set of priorities in terms of what, what we wanted to focus on. And I would also support Esmond's point in terms of the discipline uh, that is added when you have to raise uh, the income as well as spend it. That was one of the things I think that interested us in, in uh, doing this piece of work. The discipline that goes with that, I think, uh, is important because then you as politicians, in terms of your manifestos, have to think hard about the balance between how much money you're going to try and raise off the population and how you want to spend it. And certainly in my view, if you get that badly wrong on either end of that equation, then you know you, you can find difficulty with the, the electorate. So we were supportive of that idea. But certainly there's a lot more we could do, I think, in terms of our public spending priorities in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Um, ne next question. And look, um, one of the issues with Northern Ireland water, and one of the things that I think many of us looked at, and I looked at previously when I was the vice chair of the Economy Committee and various other things, one of the things we were trying to look at was, you know, how GOCOs were set up in the rest of the UK. And Northern Ireland Water, I know under infrastructure, the rest of it, it's supposed to be a GOCO, but it's not. It's some kind of strange hybrid that, for what variety of reasons. And one of the models that was being explained was, you know, it couldn't go down the Welsh water mutualisation route because of its structure and how its relationship was gone. So how does that interrelate, sort of, both, Seamus and Edmund, when you're talking about, sort of, when you talk about, sort of, uh, water charges, domestic water charges, you know, has Northern Ireland Water been given the flexibility that it has already to be able to do some of the issues that it needs to do, or are we really into, to deal with the significant wastewater problem we have, which we know we, we've got, it does, are we really being forced down that route to try and achieve that? Maybe I'll, I'll start on this one and say that back when that debate uh, was taking place, you know, we and Nick Van Bondry and community organisations got heavily involved and explored all of that and probably shifted our position uh, during, the, during the discussion. We would have opposed privatising Northern Ireland water, but certainly would have favoured the mutual option and the Welsh water one, uh, you know, was certainly one that was favoured. I think we recognise the point that you're getting at, Chair that uh, 
sewage disposal and, and, and the production of water needed a major, major investment in, in Northern Ireland and with the best will in the world it hadn't been getting that. We took part in a piece of work that Paddy Hilliard carried out as well that Esmond referred to and we did concern ourselves that people in low incomes, it was not just a simple uh, an equation of not pay anything else for water uh, uh, but they were getting big losses in other areas because of the subsidy that, that we were having to put into it. So we think a lot more careful, informed debate in that whole area uh, was important back then and certainly Im- Im- important now because it's again, it's where you set priorities in Northern Ireland to do the best job for people. Okay. And just a, fa- just a final one before I hand over the team. Uh, Esmond, just to, I think you mentioned the issues about VAT rules. And because we would be seen as a EU region uh, due to our wonderful protocol, we wouldn't be in a position to vary that even if we wanted to. Is that is, is that correct, or am I, how, how, how can we explain that one? Well, that that is my understanding, and uh, I, I have pursued this question with various authorities who I think would be considered as experts and the the answer that i'm getting back is that because de facto north and remains within the single market and remains within the the competition rules that the european court of justice has established over the years and so forth one aspect of that would be uh, that uh, the situation prior to Brexit with respect to uh, the EU prohibiting uh, a sub-regional or a Northern Ireland level of that, that would still apply. All right. Was that, would that also apply? Would there also be implications, obviously, with competition on any variations in corporation tax then as well? Uh, I'm glad you've raised that, Chair, because the same point arises. And again, I've... I've asked this question of of authorities as it were who should know the answer and what's coming back is that the previous position prior to brexit still applies we're still subject to what's called the azores judgment which was a ruling in the european court of justice some years back that if a sub-region within the European Union reduces a tax rate relative to its national rate, e.g. in this case corporation tax, then the central government, in our case the UK, has to deduct an equivalent to the revenue loss from the fiscal transfer to the region. In other words, the London government would have to deduct a block grant adjustment if corporation tax is reduced in Northern Ireland. Now, of course, it might well be argued, and it may well be the case, that even without uh, the protocol, even without the uh, Azores judgment ruling, the Treasury has a role in all of this. And I think the Treasury would take a very strong view uh, that uh, their, as it were, fiscal generosity to North Island is not going to be unbounded. And therefore, if North Island opts to have a lower than the UK corporation tax rate in 2023, according to Chancellor Sunak, it would be 25%. North Island opts to stick at the current 19%. The Treasury may well take the view that there has to be a quid pro quo for that, uh, some reduction of X amount, be it 150 million, 200 million. It would obviously have to be worked out quite precisely um, to to compensate for that. <laughs> have you got any good news, Esmond? <laughs> I'm sure something will come to life, but uh, those are the realities. You know, we need to bear these points in mind. Okay, Matthew, do you want to come? Very short one before I go to Jim. Oh, I was just going to, but just to be clear on the protocol, that only relates to a a theoretical uh, differentiation. It's it's just that it's that the assumption, Dr. Bernie, is that it would that the Azores judgment continues in relation to Northern Ireland under the protocol, that has to be confirmed, but also, as you say, it would require the UK government, and as a former Treasury official, there, I don't see any, there's, there, there's, as you have said, little cultural evidence that the UK government is suddenly going to waive the principle of the block grant adjustment for devolved taxation. They would have to be both 
we would have to both be devolving, uh, there would have to both be the devolution of VAT to Northern Ireland, a judgment made to lower that rate or increase it for the sake of argument, and the UK government would have to, the yeah. Treasury specifically would have to say they, they, their, their new approach was to not have a block grant adjustment, to just allow devolved regions to do that. That's the only, that's the only a point at which the protocol would uh, stop that happening, as it were, or could. Well, yeah, I, I, I agree with the logic of what, what Mr. O'Toole is saying there, but I suppose in theory, and on occasions, the Treasury has extended a bit of forbearance to Northern Ireland. Um, they might do something, but I suppose what I'm saying, and, and I, I have checked this with uh, a reputable source, who, uh, the, 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 the implication of the protocol is that the Azores judgment still applies to, to, to North Island. So even if the Treasury UK government wished to be generous, their, their hands are going to be tied. But as, as Mr. Toole is saying, they, they may not wish to be very generous in any case, but uh, they're not going to have the scope to do that. OK, thanks. Jim? Uh, Esmond, welcome back. There's, oh, a, there's an oil painting here. Oh, sorry. No, no, Jim, you go for it. There's an oil painting on the wall here of the members of the Assembly in 2000, and you're still on it, uh, along with myself. I think I'm the only person in the chamber who can remember you walking the corridors of this institution. You say you're in a oil painting, Jim, but that's what would be on. <laughs> <laughs> I walked into that one, didn't I? Um, could I just say, Esmond, obviously I've been following your stellar career ever since you left this institution. You certainly um, have the ability to articulate complex economic issues in a very clear way that ordinary folk like myself can understand. But you still haven't cracked the holy grail, and that is, and I want you to, to tell me if this has happened in Scotland or Wales, what is to stop the UK Treasury if we get extra fiscal powers saying they're getting these powers, they're going to raise an extra £300 million, say, from water charging, which is not perhaps a popular way of raising money, I can assure you. And they simply deduct that from the block grant because they assume it's extra money arising within the Northern Ireland Exchequer, as it were. So uh, why, do, why should we inflict pain on our community when we don't actually get any extra money? Uh, it's simply taken off what we would have got anyhow. Now, in your analysis of the situation in Wales and Scotland, is there any evidence of that having happened? I, th I think, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Jim, if I, if I may. And you're, you're flattering me there by those remarks. But I, I think it's a very good question. But the example of water charges, I think, is, is fairly clear cut because I think the assembly, the executive, could make an excellent case to the Treasury, which I suspect the Treasury would accept, that if water charges are introduced to North Island, that is bringing us into line with the situation that already exists in England, Scotland and Wales where they do pay charges. Therefore, I'd be very confident that that's a battle the executive would win with the Treasury. So I, I don't see that as being an argument against going down this route, but it, obviously this is something you have to be careful about, uh, lest if uh, you impose higher taxes within the region, as you say, uh, the Treasury with another hand simply takes away. Um, as to your question, has this already happened in the, in the cases of Scotland and Wales? Uh, that's probably a question that you could have put to the previous set of witnesses. It'd be interesting, I don't know if you did ask that, one of the, of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Um, in principle, when a tax is devolved and, has, and when it has been devolved in the case of Wales and uh, Scotland, the deduction is made, uh, it's worked out. Uh, obviously, that's a difficult process and there'll be a bit of controversy and uh, different economists and different economic modelers will come up with different answers. But eventually, and obviously there'll have to be an element of political agreement, agreement is reached between the devolved administration and the Treasury, a sum is deducted. The hope is always when you devolve a tax that uh, the economy in the region will prosper in such a way that the revenues raised will actually exceed the deduction. Now, 
that does raise an interesting question of whether that always is the case. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some evidence in the case of Scotland, for example, the, uh, the policies they pursued with respect to devolving income tax, mm -hmm. that um, th they haven't gained that much extra revenue because uh, the tax base in Scotland didn't grow as rapidly as perhaps they'd hoped it would. So that there, there is an element of risk in, in such policies, and we do need to be aware of that. Well, could I suggest, Esmond, you return to this building and take up the role of Union Minister to sell water charging to the community? I think you'll find that quite a challenging role. <laughs> uh, I know that in 2007 we suggested it, and I, it was very interesting going round the doors during that election when there was even a hint of water charging coming in, never knew it actually happening. I've never actually seen such opposition to any policy in my very long time here. Well, you may be right that this will be an unpopular policy. It certainly will require an element of political courage to move in that direction. But Northern Ireland is seriously out of line with the rest of the UK in, in this regard. And as I was trying to explain in my opening remarks, the status quo is actually inequitable because it involves a deduction of up to £280 million from the amount of money that Stormont has available from its funds. That has to be diverted into uh, running North Island Water, covering its, what would otherwise be its operating loss. That is money that is not available to improving schools, the health service, industrial development, employment creation, improvement of transport. I've, and I think that status quo actually disproportionately impacts on lower income groups, whereas not having water charges benefits all households across Northern Ireland. That is true, but it also it does benefit average and above average income households. In effect, they're they're receiving a a subsidy which, arguably, in social terms cannot be justified and is out of line, as I say, with policy and practice elsewhere. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Jim, other Jim? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Esmond. Just remind me, what is the estimated income tax take in Northern Ireland? Yeah, the figure is approximately uh, $3 billion. In 2018-19, according to HMRC, and you, you were discussing this issue of apportioning revenues across the UK with the previous evidence. Yep. Um, 2.9 billion is the most up-to-date figure that, that I have. It, it's the largest um, tax, uh, source of tax. Sorry, no, it's the second largest because VAT at that time is 3.4 billion. And then national insurance contributions were 2.7. Billion. Now, there would have been some variation since 2018-19, presumably in the next year it increased, but of course last year with the COVID recession, it would have fallen quite dramatically. So I think it's of the order of £3 billion per annum. And what is the approximate estimate of the running costs of Northern Ireland? Now, that... What, what do you mean by that? Do you mean the administrative costs of the devolved departments, or do you mean no, the costs I mean the of entirety, the entirety of act? spend, the entirety of spend via V Northern Ireland? I, I have not seen a, an estimate, uh, or, or, or indeed, and it's certainly not an official figure. Uh, sometimes uh, figures are published by departments of their uh, administ what they deem to be their administrative costs, but I don't have uh, up-to-date figures like that to hand. And indeed, I'm not absolutely certain how far they've been published in, in recent years. A sort of global sum figure for how much money it costs to administer central government in North Ireland, or indeed also you might wish to include local government and arm's length bodies and public agencies. Um, it, it, it would be a considerable figure of no doubt hundreds of millions, but I, I don't have an actual sum. But in, ter in terms of the block grant, we do know how much that is, for example. Yes. 
Yes, yes, we, we do, we do. So it's of the order of, um, in terms of so-called DEL or de departmental expenditure limit, uh, the sort of uh, cash to departments where they've discretion about spending, it is of the order of £12 billion pounds per annum. And the EMA expenditure? It's, it's roughly the same about another 12 billion and that's mostly taken up with um, benefits, pensions, I think student loans are in there as well. Yes. So, right, Jim, just, Jim, just to cut through it, I think the last set of figures that we saw that had been uh, peer reviewed was it cost 23 billion to run Northern Ireland PLC. Yes. Yeah, with Amy and Dell. Before you get the contributions to national services. Yeah. As well. So it's somewhere heading towards thirty billion pounds per year, presumably, to keep Northern Ireland afloat. I, I, I'm not sure what you mean by that phrase, uh, Mr. Alistair, afloat. But uh, the total level of expenditure, uh, both uh, Dell, Amy, and then there is the further category of so-called non-identifiable spending. That is. The, the apportioned out benefit which Northern Ireland is deemed to get from UK central spending, such as defence spending, the interest payment on national debt, uh, and various other central services, overseas aid and overseas representation. For 2018-19, it was of the order of 27 to 28 billion. Now, obviously, in the most recent year, 2021, uh, financial year has just passed because of COVID. Uh, the, the figure would be well above 30 billion because of the additional COVID spending. We know that uh, um, North Ireland received the called Barnet consequentials of over 3 billion um, and additional AME money because of COVID. So you're talking about well above 30 billion. For the totality of spending, uh, I, I'm sorry, I misunderstood your initial question, Mr. Alistair. I, I thought you were asking how much does yeah. it cost to actually yeah. administer the various departments. That's a, that's a very interesting, but maybe very hard, a very, very hard question to so, answer. So, so we got there, uh, the approximate figures uh, are 30 billion. Yeah. And off that, we raise an income tax 10%. Yes, but of course, bear in mind that uh, there are other forms of uh, uh, taxation. Oh, yes, as well. I said income tax. Yep. Yep. But at the end of the day, all that accumulates to a significant subvention. Yes. Yes, there is a significant, uh, as you term it, subvention, or as the uh, Office for National Statistics call it, the fiscal transfer. Uh, the most recent figure for 2018-19 was 9.4 billion. Um, that did include the so-called non-identifiable non-identifiable spending uh, that I was talking about earlier. So uh, if you remove that, that would take maybe three billion off the amount, but it would still be considerable, a uh, considerable sum of money and a considerable sum of money per person or per family. And if we follow the Scottish example of transferring social security to Stormont, have we any idea what the resulting administration costs would be because at the moment they're simply paid by Westminster. Uh, there would be administrative costs. They, they would be considerable. I have not seen an estimate for the figure. Um, the situation with, res with respect to Social Security is, is a very interesting one because, strictly speaking, it is a devolved matter. But um, by and large, with the exception, the notable exception over the recent set of years of the uh, welfare reform mitigation measures, North Island traditionally, at least until very recently, adopt a step by state step, very much parity with the UK or GB position. But of course, when welfare reform was introduced, e.g. with respect to the so-called sole occupancy, uh, room or bedroom tax and some other issues, the household absolute cap or limit, um, North Island has deviated from that. 
Uh, and so uh, to, a, to an extent, we've begun to use that devolved social security power, albeit to, to a limited extent. But of course, the result of that was a reduction in the block grant. Well, strictly speaking, it's not a reduction in the block grant. It is that part of the block grant. It is a bit like the argument about Northland Water and not having domestic water charges. You, as the Assembly or the Executive, ultimately have the right, as it were, the absolute right to decide how to divide up and use the uh, block grant. What I am trying to argue as an economist is that in the case of water charging, some of that funding has been preempted in a certain direction because we don't have charges. And a similar sort of logic, and you can agree with it or disagree with it, applies in the case of the welfare mitigation measures. A certain sum of money is now uh, has to be spent on that, which obviously cannot be spent on other things like education, uh, health, industrial promotion, whatever. But ultimately, that's a policy decision, and it's one that the executive have taken. But in terms of a fiscal commission looking at extra fiscal powers for Northern Ireland, it's in the context of the figures that I've discussed with you. And what it really comes down to is that the only option that you've put forward and articulated really is that we charge our consumers water charges? Well, it's not the only one I, I was saying was feasible. You could look at stamp duty and, and landfill and air passenger duty. And I think uh, the case for corporation tax may actually be becoming stronger again than, than it was several years ago. Um, I think it's important to hold in mind two things which may seem in contradiction, but they're not. I think we have to recognize, first of all, that uh, North Ireland has this large, as you call it, subvention or transfer from the UK exchequer, and that's going to remain the case. So that's one point. But then alongside that, we can still strive to have a situation where at the margin, on a particular policy making decision where Stormont is thinking about spending an extra hundred or 200 million on whatever the policy might be, uh, that to a greater extent than hitherto, there should be some connection about that decision to raise spending at the margin and raising the revenues regionally to either fully or partly pay for that. And I think there would be benefits in strengthening that connection. It's back to the point about accountability. It's back to the point about trying to deal with the sort of, if I may call it, the free money mindset or mentality that was evidenced uh, through RHI. But all that flexibility under the protocol is restrained by the Azores judgment. It's restrained, uh, but it, it's still, there still may be a case for devolving a tax if you have confidence, and here you're back to an element of risk, but in making decisions about the economy, sometimes calculated risks do have to be taken. Um, if you feel that, for example, in varying corporation tax compared to the UK average, that would cause a sufficient boost to the North Island economy and indeed in terms of revenues collected that in some sense you, you would gain back the deduction and more. But it is a risk and as I said, the Scottish experience of devolving income tax, um, that, that the, their experience of that has not been all that favourable. So sometimes the risks can turn out badly from the point of view of the devolved administration taking on extra uh, tax raising powers. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much, indeed, Jim. Okay. Uh, Philip? Thank there you, go, Philip. Uh, th th thank you. Uh, 
both to uh, Dr. Bernie uh, and Seamus uh, for the presentation. Just following on from the last point there, uh, just even the last sentence uh, by, by Esmond in terms of the experience of Scotland. I mean, it, it, when he t indicates about the maybe not so positive experience of Scotland in terms of having devolved income tax, I mean, one thing that it has done has ensured a fair tax system. It may not have actually raised more revenue, but it, I mean, it has instigated a fair tax system. Uh, ho hopefully he would agree with that. Uh, and secondly, just in terms of the other point he was making in relation to corporation tax, uh, because we have the option uh, of not following and going to 25% and keeping it at 19%. Uh, at I mean, has there been any work done in terms of what that could potentially actually raise uh, in terms of additional revenue if we didn't follow suit and go to 25 and stayed at 19%. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mr. McGuigan. So, first of all, the um, point about the Scottish income tax, it's certainly true to use the technical language. The Scottish system has become more so called progressive. They've pushed up the uh, 20, many of the people who would have been paying 20% now pay 21%, 40, 40% people are paying 41 and 45% people in the rest of the UK are now paying 46. And uh, they've, the point of income at which you start to pay 41% as it now is in Scotland is now considerably lower. It's around about 44,000 compared to the UK where it starts at about 50,000. So uh, how you judge that is really in the eye of the beholder. It, um, it moved in a progressive direction, moved towards greater equality of outcome. Uh, but obviously, if you are a, let's say, a school principal in Edinburgh earning £50,000 per annum, uh, the income tax you will be paying compared to your counterpart in uh, England or the North Island will now be roughly £100 a month higher. So. For people higher up the income scale, um, they there, there's an appreciable extra amount of income tax paid. Now you can judge that as good or bad, depending on your political preferences. Um, with respect to the uh, corporation tax point, I think what we need to think about, and it's it's maybe a debate that your committee uh, will will have in the future. What what we really have to ask ourselves is: Does North Ireland wish to stick at the current nineteen percent when GB goes up to twenty five? In other words, create a six percentage point divergence. How much would be deducted by the Treasury? And you're back to the Azores question there, but I think it does apply in some shape or form, whether through the protocol or whether through um, lack of treasury forbearance. How much would the deduction be? And I, we don't know because the question hasn't been asked yet and the calculations have not been made, but I suspect it would be considerable and I suspect it would be in the range of between £150 million pounds per annum and £300 million pounds per annum. Um, that and then finally, and again, this work has not been done yet. You have to ask what would be the impact of the North Island economy in terms of promotion of inward investment, for example, or indeed development of indigenous companies from having a 19% rate here compared to 25% in England, Scotland, and Wales. So uh, I'm sorry, I can't give you a definite answer because the work has not yet been done because the change in announced by the Chancellor only appeared in March. Uh, I think uh, policymakers here in Belfast, in a sense, have to work out what position they should adopt in the light of that situation, and indeed also the light of changes that are happening in America, and no doubt in other parts of the world as well. There are big changes in terms of the OECD's approach to corporate taxation, and at a wider global level, how you tax digital companies. So there are a lot of things that are fluid. That's going to have a very big impact on the Irish Republic at its 12.5% rate, perhaps in the future in any case. And obviously, Northern Ireland is a small region. We need to be fleet-footed. 
and think about how we position ourselves in that broader shifting international tax context. Okay, fair, fair enough. Just uh, in terms of some of the taxes that you said that we, we, can, we can't or won't likely be devolved, I mean, both Scotland and Wales, uh, as you said, have got already got stamp duty, landfill tax, income tax devolved. So, I mean, is there any particular barriers likely to, for example, those three taxes being devolved to the north? And if there are, what are they? I, I don't think they're necessarily very strong practical impediments. They're thinking back to uh, when when Mr. Alistair talked to me about or asked me about administrative costs. There there is that issue about administering taxes uh, that obviously has to be factored into the equation when you work out is it worthwhile doing this because. If North End devolves stamp duty or landfill, there would be an administrative cost. It might be several million pounds per annum because the Scottish experience suggests that having those tax devolved and administering them within the region, as it were, can cost that order of magnitude. You do need to ask whether that's something you would wish to 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 pay you you'd be collecting revenue but you'd be paying for the admin whereas at the moment it's all coming out of hmrc and out of as it were the central costs of of running the uk government stamp duty um another thing to bear in mind is the stamp duty threshold at least prior to covid because at the moment we're in this unusual situation of the, the of the holiday, the COVID measures, and so forth, but and, and hopefully that you know with improved public health, we we are in a situation where stamp duty will probably return in the summer. It's obviously not good news uh, in, in that sense, but the the improvement in public health so this is of course good news. Um, it was one hundred twenty at one hundred twenty five thousand now. Because house prices on average in North Island are lower than the UK average, uh, the most recent figure from Land and Property Services suggests that the average at the end of last year in North Island, the average house price in North Island was about 147,000. I think I put the figure into the written note I, I sent. We're not very far above 125,000 in any case. So what I'm saying is um, the, the benefit from raising the threshold in the case of North Island might be quite small because so many houses in North Island already sell at either below the threshold or not much above it. So in practice, most house purchasers in North Island prior to March 2020 weren't paying huge amounts of stamp duty in any case, although obviously there would be exceptions at the top end of the market. Okay, finally, uh, Chair, with your indulgence, yes, I mean, you, you talked about the, the positive example of the plastic bag tax, mm -hmm. for example, I mean, it changes people's behaviour, it also raises additional revenue. I mean, obviously, there, there are likely to be further environmental and, and potentially healthy lifestyle taxes that suggest that, I mean, have you any sense of potential taxes along that line and where, where it's worked or kind of problems that they may uh, encounter? Well, it's uh, thank you very much. It's a fascinating question. Uh, and there is scope and to some degree, um, certainly at the UK wide level, uh, let alone what happens at the North and Devolve level, certain changes will be necessary. The point is often made that um, a very considerable amount of revenue, I think in total it amounts to nearly £40 billion per annum, are raised in the UK from taxation on vehicles, be it vehicle excise duty or, of course, the considerable amount of duty uh, paid every time you buy a litre of petrol or diesel, etc. Now, if we are moving to a situation where uh, fossil fuel based cars and lorries are gradually over the next decade or 15, 20 years being phased out. That is a revenue stream which is gradually going to trickle away or indeed more than gradually. It 
might start to decline quite rapidly if other policies move with uh, reasonable speed. So there is going to be a challenge of, as we move to less carbon-based transport, electric vehicles, etc., how do you tax that? Now, I think there is a case, and again, we're a bit into um, one of Mr. Wells' questions about how much political courage do you want to have, but I think at some point we need to think about road pricing policies. In other words, instead of charging people, as we do at the moment, for the amount of petrol you put into the tank of your car or um, your annual uh, uh car tax, be it a hundred pounds or the bigger the car or 300 pounds or whatever, uh, it would seem fairer. And I think we probably have to move down this route that in some sense, using microchips in the bonnet and cameras and all the rest of it, according to the number of miles you drive and hence the amount of pollution or congestion you're adding to, you will be charged a certain amount. So that's the long run agenda. It's politically very challenging, but it is entirely feasible. It's been done in other parts of the world. The technology exists. It can be done, and arguably it will have to be done as uh, fossil fuel usage, particularly in terms of transport, declines. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay, cheers, Philip. Matthew? Thank you. Oh, just before, Matthew, I'd, I've put uh, LPS off until just after four o'clock. Okay. So I, I did that, but I've given them the extra time because I think this is this is important. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you, and th thanks for your evidence so far. Both particularly Esmond has been really useful and thorough. Um, the ex Treasury official in me is, you know, nodding along when we talk about revenue raising possibilities. The uh, politician in me is um, telling myself to stop nodding. Um, uh, but um, just on the on the so there's a few things. First of all, fiscal commission is a great. I agree with you. A good thing we were debating the other day and the day before yesterday in the assembly the regional rates order, and it's clear that that is the only well basically it's the only revenue source that we that is used managed actively um, uh, by the executive. Um, uh, and it is, I think, with the regional and district rate together, it's over a billion pounds of revenue locally. Are you, would you be concerned that, um, given we, given we don't know yet what is going to happen to the, to the sort of like the, the structural nature of commercial property generally, and we don't know yet exactly how how economic behaviour has shifted. Would you be concerned that there's a that before we even get on to and I agree there are lots of areas for potential additional fiscal devolution. I strongly agree with that. But are, would you be concerned that the one area of substantive revenue raising we have here might already be at risk because of the way commercial property is changing? Mm. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Till. Obviously, you're right that uh, there's been a huge shock to the commercial property market. Uh, there are a lot of unknowns. <laughs> So that does create an element of uncertainty. Uh, uh, that, that's worrisome because, as you say, uh, the uh, regional rate is one of the few elements of, of existing tax uh, and charge varying power that, that Stormont exercises. I, I did mention in passing in my opening about the extent to which there are reliefs from non-domestic rates in North Island. These reliefs are considerable. Uh, both in 2015 and 2019, the Department of Finance or its predecessor was reckoning in total they came to over £200 million per annum. Some of that would be a revenue loss to the councils, some to Storm. Uh, and I do think uh, those reliefs do need to be looked at. But there is a tension here because, uh, for example, I I'm not convinced that it's right that North Island has a much stronger relief for empty property than um, England, Scotland, Wales. Um, but given the shock we've just had over the last year, the tension, I suppose, is you might wish to see the economy emerge from COVID and see where things have settled down before hitting it again with another uh, tax impost, uh, as it were. 
but I think in the long run, it's very hard to justify the extent of reliefs that, that and indeed they've been expen- extended during the period of devolution. Um, and this, this is contrary to wise taxation policy where you want to widen your base but reduce the rates at which every tax is paid on average in order to avoid you know, impacting the efficiency and cost structure of businesses excessively. Thank you. Do you think that um, there is a case for if, if there was further devolution of tax powers in whatever area, that there would have to be um, uh, some mechanism via and I know you're going to be involved in the fiscal council, so you wouldn't comment on it. But there would have to be some mechanism to do uh, f- um, a, a proper horizon forecast of uh, the potential um, uh, revenue raised in that and, and, the, and the economic impact of it. Um, obviously, the treasury forecast, in conjunction with the OBR, the treasury forecasts receipts and all t- on of on every tax that is levied. Um, is that something we should have the power to do here, or could we just get the OBR to do it? Well, well, again, thank you very much. And uh, I think is it the 9th of June, but certainly thereabouts. Uh, you, your committee has invited the fiscal council, so um, uh, you'll have chance to ask that question to the council. <laughs> itself. I, I'll not preempt an answer now, but obviously. This is an important question, uh, but it's but who should do the forecasts? So at the moment, there are a number of it's where university, uh, independent and commercial based uh, forecasting models of the North Island economy, and to varying extents, they may or may not be able to forecast um, uh, revenues from a certain tax. Uh, so I suppose the uh, question then arises, do we rely on that in the future or, as you say, go down the route that the OBR in London and then more recently the Scottish Fiscal Commission, with whom you've just been talking, uh, do for Scotland? But uh, that will be a question I think we'll return to on another day. Would Sorry. It, would it be fair to say that, that I mean, though I basically agree, very, very strongly agree on the case for at least examining areas of further fiscal devolution. I'm also very strongly critical of one notable area of fiscal devolution, which was mentioned earlier, which was APD, which is effectively now a subsidy for non, not just non-existent flights, but flights that would appear to be very unlikely to return to Northern <laughs> Ireland, given the state of global aviation with the best will in the world. Um, so I mean, that would I mean the forecast, the, the, the kind of adjustment that the block grant adjustment that was constructed then came from a a forecast of foregone revenue that presumably came from bluntly the treasury and it was in their interests to have a not necessarily maximalist but to not be skimping when it came to the forecast of foregone revenue and it has worked in their favor um is that i, I suppose I'm, I'm, that's a statement rather than a question is, is that an unfair depiction of what's happened <laughs> Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that the Treasury's behaviour in this regard was malign. No, no, I don't, I, no I don't think that at all. At that time was unreasonable. Uh, it, it, it was hard at that time to forecast the commercial robustness of continental airlines, and in particular their Belfast route, and then subsequently Norwegian Airlines operated one into to Boston, mm-hmm. I think, for a number of years. Uh, it, it illustrates the point there are always going to be risks, and in this case, the risk came down badly for Northern Ireland, but I wouldn't necessarily blame anybody for that. Um, and I think the deduction is somewhere between two and three million pounds per annum. Uh, there remains the question of whether the remainder of APD for the flights that we do have and hopefully will have in the opening up post COVID because the extent of air traffic is still very, very low at the moment, whether we should move towards a blanket devolution of the entirety Short of APD. APD. And obviously there would be a strong view coming out of the tourism sector 
but also some bits of the business community more broadly that uh, the sort of catalytic effects in the economy could be quite considerable. You do have to weigh that against, obviously, the carbon produced by air travel. But as I said, and, uh, there, there's various pieces of evidence to back this point up. APD was never really a very genuine environmental tax. Oh, it wasn't well designed. And I think it's possible intellectually consistently to argue, yeah, we could devolve APD, we could reduce it or indeed scrap it, but there should be some broader system of taxing or charging for carbon in the round. Okay, and then my very final question, I promise, is just on, on the subject of borrowing and um, it, it's obviously true to say we talk about the, the, the other bit of the, you know, it, clearly we have a significant sub subvention slash fiscal transfer in Northern Ireland, but in a sense, uh, at the minute, through the most developed countries, because they, they very few countries uh, are currently uh, um, raising what they spend. There is a, 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 a everyone is, and they're, and they're borrowing it. What is our, so we have a, a we haven't used for a while, our RRI borrowing headroom. Do you think we should be doing more of that? Um, uh, and are you satisfied with the way we have used it in the past? I, has it been used actually for investment rather than um, some, you know, slightly less value-added things? Uh, there's some very good and deep questions there. They are actually hard to answer. So uh, I haven't seen data that would allow one to particularly examine the uh, money borrowed through RRI, how much of it was really funding uh, capital as opposed to more related to resource spending. I suspect it's been something of a mix in practice and uh, therefore has it fulfilled the name on the tin, reinvestment and reform to an extent, but maybe not as much as was hoped back in 2002, 2003, or when, whenever uh, uh, the then Chancellor Gordon Brown introduced it or, or gave that power to, to the Storm Executive. I think very importantly, what um, the Executive needs to do, which I'm, I, they, they haven't done hitherto, or at least if they have, it's certainly not been put into the public domain, is get some sense of what is the totality of debt which um, the public sector in Northern Ireland, not just uh, the government departments, but various public agencies uh, added on to that. And you could add in local government as well, if, if you wished. How big is that debt? How big is the sort of annual interest charge or the unitary charges or whatever? You might also want to look at... Um, uh, payments relating to public-private partnerships and PFIs in the past to get some sense of, of how much debt has been carried and then you know move on to the question of is it still at a sustainable level and should we borrow more? At the moment, I think it's hard to answer those questions because we, we do lack the data. Uh, we do know that both Scotland and Wales have, have borrowing powers as well. Uh, the borrowing powers that Stormont have are, are not out of line with those in Wales on a per head population basis. Um, they may actually be greater. Um, Scotland probably, according to some definitions, has a higher borrowing headroom or capacity, although not all of that has been used hitherto. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, Pat? Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Dr. Desmond. Um, I, I had a, a little bar down in Donegal Quay back in the early 70s, and I've seen the vast revenue and money which was going into the harbour commissioners. You, that hasn't been mentioned in your thought, or is that part of your brief or should the executive be looking at that because they seem to have very good trading terms in order to amass that amount of wealth which is massed down there. That's the first question. The second one goes back to Mr Alistair's question and that was to do with the amount of money. Uh, I see that Scotland and Wales earn something between 20 and 30 percent. 
we in Northern Ireland are nine, nine percent. But whenever you give those figures, uh, what uh, Mr. Alistair had asked about the intervention and how much it was, you weren't bringing in, like, even in the small businesses that I sold in my lifetime, I have corporation tax uh, to pay on them, as well as the profits that you make on them. Has there been a study done in here in Northern Ireland for the total tax lift out of the six counties, which goes across the water, and then subtract that from what it takes in order to run the place. You, your figure there was two or three million billion pounds. Is that, is that where you see that? Is that taken in all of the revenue which is left it here collectively in Northern Ireland and amassed in that pot, which then leaves and goes across, regardless when the formula is worked out in Barnet and what comes back to us? Okay, so thank you. Well, uh, to deal with the bit at the end, um, the Office for National Statistics, the UK statistical agency, which is independent of government, uh, they use techniques of apportioning. They do try to capture or represent all of the tax collected at Northern Ireland. Now, some of it is an estimate that's based on shares of population, shares of other types of economic activity. Uh, so when I say the level of income tax is 2.9 billion and that was three plus billion, um, there, there's some uncertainty, plus or minus, around that admittedly very big figure. But I think those figures are probably broadly correct and hence had turned the figure about the fiscal transfer, the 9.4 billion in 2018-19, is broadly correct, albeit including the non-identifiable spending on UK national debt, overseas aid, overseas representation, and uh, a North Island share, as it were, of UK general defence spending. Now, your, your question, you, you mentioned the Harbour yeah. Commissioner Oh, what, are you talking about Belfast, or Belfast. which port are you talking about? I'm just talking about Belfast Harbour Commission, the amount of money and wealth right. well, which has um, accumulated. I, I, there, there is a question about the so-called reserves of uh, various public bodies and agencies across Northern Ireland, not just the... Uh, various ports and the harbour commissioners, so it's sort of it's unfair to maybe would be unfair to single them out. But uh, and really the NICFA report was really about the issue of, of tax variation. There but there is a legitimate question of the extent to which Stormont, the executive, North and Central Government could say to various public agencies across Northern Ireland to further education colleges, indeed to, you know, an employee of a university, you could say to the universities, you could say to the harbour commissioners, etc. Look, to the extent that you have reserves, instead of us providing you with grant from Stormont, you should make do with running down your reserves. Now, this is a hugely <laughs> debatable and controversial area because there, of course, will be varying estimates and views of how big the reserves are of these various public bodies. And indeed, in some cases, do they really have net reserves at all uh, because of the level of debt and so forth? Uh, so to what extent is it meaningful to talk about um, the reserves? now? I think back uh, about 10 years ago, there, there was a proposal uh, to uh, fund a, a certain level of public expenditure based on extracting a certain amount of reserves from Belfast Harbour Commissioners. That didn't happen, rightly or wrongly. Uh, we're obviously in a different economic position now. Uh, the, uh, I'm sure they'll speak for themselves that the harbour will probably argue, as will their counterparts at the other North Island ports and harbours, uh, this is a very difficult time for them in terms of the COVID-related recession, in terms of any impact on uh, Great Britain to North Island trade at the moment also. Um, this is not a good time, they would say, to come to us and ask us to surrender reserves. So it, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, I don't have the data to say to what extent currently there is scope 
for Stormont to reduce the call on its block grant by requiring these various public bodies to, to as it were, operate off reserve rather than um, cash coming as grant from the North Island Regional Government. And uh, last... just, a, just a short one, because uh, we're sort of running over time a wee bit. I understand, uh, Chair, and I will try to be as quick as I can, but I did wait quite a long time in oh, order to it. get in. So thank you. <laughs> uh, the Resign. Operation That's me told off. Resign. 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 <laughs> the, the, no, no, there's been enough for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, the 13, the 13, the 12 and a half to 13 percent of corporation tax in the south of Ireland really makes it nearly impossible for Northern Ireland on this island. Uh, which is competing with both jurisdictions in order to try and have a stable business here that can compete with their southern counterparts in order to try and even look at increasing that. I mean, the top all should be to try and lower it rather than increase it. Do you agree with that? Or where, where, where was the, the point uh, with the British government trying to raise it to 25%? I mean, I think that would put us... At a, at a position that we just would nearly find it impossible to attract inward investment or compete. I, I don't. I would put it as strongly as say it would make it impossible because there are a range of factors that make an area attractive to inward investors: your availability of skilled labour, what wage rates, other labour costs have to be paid, what is your transport infrastructure like, do you have ready access to research and development facilities. So to some extent, um, certainly in the past and no doubt the future, um, North Island obviously has had to play to its own particular strengths and has had to say to inward investors, look, you could go to Dublin, you could go to Dundalk, you can go to Cork and you get very low corporation tax. But equally, if you come to Belfast, we have certain strengths as well. And in some areas of the economy, that's worked quite well. Belfast, particularly Belfast, has been the greater Belfast area in the last 15 or so years has had an extremely high rate of inward investment from US-based um, service sector companies. But the widening gap in corporation tax, if we go up to 25% of the Southern Irish rate remains at 125 And remember, that's the nominal quota rate, but the practical rate that so particularly some very big companies in the Republic are actually paying is much, much lower in practice, as we've seen from the experience of, for example, Apple and the controversy around its tax payment or lack of tax payment, um, is, is, is sometimes far below the, um, the nominal quote at 12.5%. So it, it makes life harder for Invest Northern Ireland and it makes life harder for, for businesses uh, that are operating here and competing. I, I certainly can't argue with that. I don't know if it makes life impossible, but it does make it harder. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Matt. Sir. Thanks, sir. Uh, Malisha. Pauline Castle I think you're still on mute. Lisa? Lisa, are you on yeah. mute? Oh, good. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can, yeah. Yeah, okay. Factor Old Esmond, August Seamus, you're both very welcome. Uh, just in terms of that as well, too, and I know that our main focus here today was about the, and, and the sense they can transfer of powers to Northern Ireland, looking at our ability to uh, raise funds and taking responsibility then for the distribution of the same funds ourselves. Uh, but that at the end of the day, whenever you do look at the Northern Irish economy, and you know, uh, I'm thinking uh, in, in terms of uh, the Northern Irish economy from the time of partition, in particular whenever it was a net contributor to uh, the British economy, uh, it is now 
just the opposite. Uh, uh, and when when you talk there about uh, uh, the, the intervention, like and uh, what does it be depend on each and every year? Uh, like quite one hasn't just those figures exactly one way or the other. And there's still a lot of dispute, even to what extent, on the amount of money that is actually raised within this economy itself. Uh, there's no doubt about one thing, and that is that uh, we're totally dependent. Uh, and we're not functioning that well as an economy. And that the irrespective of whether or not we have the ability, we'll say, to raise some of our own taxes, and I think that's welcome in itself, it still won't address sort of the central issue. Uh, and the central issue here being the creation of wealth within the Northern Irish economy. It's the very reason why there's that house pricing and everything else is much lower than it is in other places, because the, basically the wealth here in order to create that kind of demand and that will say for uh, the houses uh, at, at, at a higher price or whatever it might be. And I know Evan, that you actually uh, alluded there to, we'll say, uh, other advantages that we might have, we'll say, at the present time within the Northern Irish economy with our labour force and them being well enough educated. But that is exactly something that we're competing with in terms of even the Republic at the present time. But they have exactly the same qualities. But over and above everything else as well, too, they are still part of the single market, which now is to our advantage that we're going to be part of that single market as well. So my point just being and coming back to is that uh, when it does come to uh, different instruments, we'll say, for raising taxation, uh, is it not totally and absolutely dependent, first and foremost, on the creation of wealth? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. McHugh. Yeah, I, th I think you make an excellent point there in the emphasis on creating wealth. So I, I certainly endorse that. And that creates very real dilemmas, what we call trade-offs, where you, you, there are two things you want to achieve, but if you go for one, you get less of the other, and if you go for the other, you get less of the first thing. So uh, it's all very well devolving income tax to Stormont, and you might say, let's go down the Scottish route of pushing up the 40% rate to 41 or 42% or the 45% rate to 46 or 47 or 48, whatever. But if you do that, arguably the very limited number of entrepreneurs that we currently have, you'll be discouraging any growth in that base of entrepreneurship. So, you know, I can't say to you, you're the politicians, you've stood for election, you've been elected, you have mandates, and those mandates to varying degrees will reflect either a wish for greater equality or a wish for greater growth and efficiency. Somehow or other, you've got to balance that and it's going to be difficult uh, in the case of income tax, for example. Well, ultimately, but just if I may come back on this point, what, in your opinion, do you think is it that's uh, hampering uh, the growth and development, we'll say, of the economy here in particular for uh, the north of Ireland in comparison to the Republic? And that, again, is a very interesting question, and it would take a, a many sessions of its own right to, to get to the heart of that, I think. Um, I, I've long felt that for decades the key strategic weakness of the North End economy is that we've got a relatively low level of productivity, that's output per worker. That means in turn we can't pay as high wages as other parts of, of the UK or Britain and Ireland or, or Europe. And it also means that our businesses tend to be less competitive and expand less rapidly. Why do we have a low level of productivity? Um, there are many explanations for that. Some of it is to do with our industrial training system. Uh, we probably don't have enough apprentice trained and technical and vocational skills. And I think there are also questions about the capacity and capability of our management. Um, a very interesting survey was conducted about a decade ago uh, through a method uh, developed by the McKinsey consultants. And it showed that uh, management capacity in Northern Ireland was lagging that of a wide range of other global economies. So I think fundamentally those are the issues. 
uh, at the start, I was saying fiscal devolution is not going to be a miracle cure. It, it might help a little bit by, you know, for example, incentivizing air travel through cutting APD might encourage, you know, bringing in new ideas, bringing in inward investment. Cutting correlation tax might uh, have some effect in terms of bringing in new companies. But uh, probably fundamentally, we do need to address the training system and um, the capacity, the experience, uh, the skill sets that our, 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 our ma senior managers have. And I know that uh, it would be unfair of me to ask you to sort of uh, give an answer on this one, but I do think that looking at uh, the likes of the north of Ireland and addressing those issues in isolation, it won't allow us to really get to the core of the matter, and it does demand a much wider debate uh, on everyone's part to ensure that we do realise our full potential, our full potential in the way we contribute even to the economy of the whole island. And there's something that's central to what's happening in the northwest now, in particular, and I do think it should be widened for the whole island as well. Well, by all means, North Island firms should, where it's appropriate, collaborate with counterparts south of the border, but on other occasions they'll be competing. And similarly, uh, we need to develop to the full potential the links that undoubtedly exist between businesses here and businesses in Great Britain. So, you know, some of this is politically blind, as it were. We need to strengthen our capacity to compete. Yeah, and collaborate north, south, and east, west. Yeah, I agree with you, Kermago. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed, uh, Seamus. And as a, thank you very much indeed for a very comprehensive evidence session as well, uh, Seamus. Sorry we didn't get so much time to talk to you, but Esmond will be talking to you again fairly soon. I understand, and we're looking forward to that. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Much thank you very to much talk indeed. To the expert and Esmond. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, team. Next uh, item on the agenda is Land and Property Services on COVID recovery, repayment issues, and business rates reform. Uh, could, uh, Stephen, can I bring on uh, Ian and Alan, please? Yeah, Ian, Alan. Really sorry for uh, being uh, delayed. Uh, we were busy talking about tax raising powers, or not, as the case may be, and we went on quite a bit. So that I know that would be sort of very close to your proverbial hearts, both of you. So to do that as well. Uh, team, uh, we're taking oral evidence from the Department of Land and Property Service, uh, COVID recovery issues around repayments and COVID-related schemes and business rates reform. The session has been recorded by Hansard. Uh, briefing notes on page 242. Uh, the Minister's correspondence on localised restriction support scheme is on page 249. And there's a tabled update uh, and a tabled update letter from the Minister. Uh, that's on your tabled papers, and that's on page 3. A copy of LPS's 2019-20 trust statements on page 268, and a published paper from the Institute for Fiscal Studies and Rates Reform at page 308. Uh, Ian, Alan, who's, uh, who's speaking on this one? Uh, Ian, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, yes, Chair, I'll start then on the LRSS payments, the overpayments and the eligible payments. Um, uh, very briefly, just a, a rundown of the background to the issue. Um, as you know, um, the LRSS had to be designed and implemented very quickly um, from scratch starting last October. Um, and the context changed quite rapidly over the, the months of the scheme has been in operation. Um, now, it had been understood at the beginning that there were risks in delivering at that kind of pace. Um, and so there would be errors and potential fraud in the scheme. Um, but the judgment was taken by the department at the time was that the risks were justified because of the extreme nature of the hardship being faced by the businesses that the, the scheme was designed to, to uh, support. So we needed to try and ensure that we delivered as rapidly as possible. Now, normally you're doing a grant scheme, you would try to build controls into the system up front. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have the luxury of the time to do that with the LRSS. So what we have to rely on in these circumstances are what are called post-event assurance checks. Um, so that's a review of the payments that have been issued. Um, to find errors and possible frauds after the event. Um, this is one of the controls recommended by the Northern Ireland Audit Office in a report they issued on COVID supports last September. Now, how we've approached this task in the LRSS is that we've uh, combined it with work that we had to do, um, anticipated we would have to do to prepare for um, easing of restrictions and then the ending of LRSS payments. 
Uh, and the assumption was that different sectors and types of business would be allowed to reopen at different stages. Um, so we would need to be able to categorize all the approved businesses to identify which ones should continue to be paid as the restrictions started to, to ease and that's in effect what has happened. So we've been working on that since um, around Christmas time. Now what we had to do is go through all 15,200 of the approved applications that we've, um, that we've processed and categorize each one um, and then identify as part of that process where we may have approved an ineligible business for the, for the funding. Um, we also ran an analysis on that categorization um, of the businesses to check how much each application should have received, how much it actually had received, and then identify people who might be underpaid or overpaid uh, and make adjustments um, accordingly to, to correct that. And we also had to run checks on duplicate payments where um, so one business may have made multiple applications and we may have accidentally approved more than one for the same business, or where applications were made to our scheme and then also one of the other schemes run by another department. Um, principally the Department for the Economy, to try and catch any double funding and double payments. Um, so the letters to uh, the committee from the Minister are to advise uh, you of what the outcomes of that process have been. Um, I have to apologise that the most recent letter only came today um, because we had run another analysis over the weekend and no one was going to be here talking about it. I wanted to make sure the committee had the most up-to-date information uh, to, to share it with you. So, um, briefly to summarise what the two letters tell you um, and what has happened in between the two letters um, being issued. So, in the first letter the Minister um, issued on the 13th of April, he advised the committee that uh, 479 applications had resulted in emails advising the applicants that they had been overpaid or they received money that they weren't entitled to. And the estimated value of those overpayments was £4.26 million. Pounds. Um, just need to clarify one point that wasn't clear in the original letter is that there were 479 applications, but um, those applications were from 450 businesses because um, some of the businesses involved had multiple applications, um, either for the same property or for multiple properties. So of those 450 businesses, what's happened um, in the intervening period of time? Um, a number of them had asked for the decision to be reassessed, uh, and we've had a look at those, and 66 have been recategorised and now no longer need to repay anything because they've been judged to be eligible for the funding. Mm -hmm. um, 26 businesses are repaid the grant either in full or in part. Um, I think it's 21 in full and five in part. Mm -hmm. um, Six of the, those businesses have been approved, but we haven't actually released any money to them. Um, the purpose of the email was to let them know that they wouldn't be receiving anything and that we'd reassess their, their eligibility. Um, we've been doing a bit of work with the Department of the Economy and one of their schemes. Um, and so for five of those businesses, the money that they've been paid from the LRSS has been offset against the entitlement that they would have had from the DFE scheme, the Coronavirus Restrictions Business Support Scheme. Um, get the name correct. Um, so that means they don't have to repay anything to, to us. So that leaves 347 still in an overpayment situation. And of those, we think 262 will be eligible for um, a payment of some amount from one of the new schemes that the Minister announced on the 15th. So we advise those businesses to hold off doing anything until they um, get some confirmation what the eligibility might be. Yeah. For some of those businesses, um, their entitlement to the new scheme will, will wipe out the overpayment on the LRSS and they don't need to repay us anything. In other cases, it will reduce the amount that they have to repay to us quite substantially. Um, and the biggest shifts, if, if you're interested in what happened in between time, um, when a business we thought was ineligible got changed back to eligible, is largely around um, takeaway food establishments and cafes. This has been one of the most difficult things for the uh, the team to assess whether a business is in fact a cafe or a takeaway business. Um, the, the boundary between the two is not entirely clear. Yeah. Um, uh, and there's, there's quite a bit of work needs to be done just to try and assess in each individual case what's, what's correct there. Um, hardware businesses, um, some have been identified as hardware businesses, but they've been recategorized back to non-essential retail. Um, some food retailers, again, categorised back to being cafes um, as opposed to food retailers. And then um, another difficult area was around um, the boundary line between a health type service um, and a, a close contact service. So, for example, um, uh, physiotherapy um, is a health related service, chiropractic uh, practice are health related. Then there'll be other kind of massage businesses which aren't health related, um, but the boundary between the two is sometimes not all that easy to determine. Uh, and sometimes there are mixed businesses and you have to work out what the balance between the two is. Uh, and then there are also quite a number which you were able to prove that although it looked like they had ceased trading, um, they in fact hadn't and were still continuing to trade and were able to satisfy us in that point. 
So uh, in today's letter, then, the Minister advises of some further cases which have identified um, another 113 potentially ineligible businesses and another 195 who have been overpaid. Uh, so the main issue here on the overpayments is that um, there were a number of businesses um, who were permitted to reopen on either the 23rd of April or the 30th of April who had been overpaid. And um, by the reopening date, the, um, the overpayment had not been addressed through the progression of the, the time of the scheme. So there, there are a number of reasons why that had happened. Um, we had mistakenly approved duplicate or multiple applications for the same business um, and had sort of caught those in January or February um, and we're trying to address that um, through continuing to pay one and not pay others. Um, the business may have been paid twice for the same period of time. It's happened in a number of small number of cases. Um, in some cases, the business has been paid for a period of restrictions that they weren't actually entitled to. Um, and this is where some of the issues around um, when people were required to shut and when they were allowed to reopen wasn't always entirely clear cut. So in cases like um, uh, some of the letters mentioned dog groomers and telephone repair businesses are two examples where the, the rules changed quite rapidly and, and we weren't uh, aware uh, in time to catch some of those. And then there are a number of businesses which have been paid at a higher rate than they had actually been entitled to. Um, would need to advise the committee that there are um, some more businesses um, which may still be overpaid um, when the remaining uh, classes of business, the hospitality principally, uh, and gyms um, are allowed to reopen um, if the executive takes the expected decision tomorrow. Um, we'd be reopening from the 24th of May, so there may still be some further cases of overpayments to be identified then. Um, the maximum number of businesses that will be is 135, and the value will be up to 1 million and eight thousand pounds. If, uh, but I suspect it will be actually lower than that whenever we come round to, to doing the final checks. But of course, update the committee after that final payment batch is released, and we've done that analysis. I'm happy to take any questions that you've got. Okay, and just um, just two short ones. Um, the first one is look. I think I, I just I was just looking for the percentage figure, but the overall percentage figure of uh, overpayments or ineligible payments is around about two percent, isn't it? Um, one point six the night we were to this, yeah. Yeah, so uh, sort of bearing in mind the sort of the speed with what it's all going you look know, like, uh, I speak for the rest of the committee and uh, personally, you know, we've been very impressed about how LPS has had to repurpose itself and get on with sort of this work as well. And I know any sort of public expenditure or a lack of ineligible sort of brings that, but you know, it, the the key of the figure of about one point six, one point seven percent is quite important uh, that we bear in mind what we're looking at. The other issue um, for me is, have we identified any fraud, which is ob obviously the other concern that we, we have? Sorry, you broke up a little bit there. I didn't, didn't hear the question. Yeah, just sorry. Have we identified any fraud? There are 20 suspected fraud cases um, that we've identified, and so those have been referred to the fraud investigators to have a look at. Okay, that's 20. Two zero. Two yeah, zero, fine. yes. Okay, and thanks. And yeah. Jim? Uh, again, to... To repeat the remarks of the chair, I think that's a remarkable achievement if we're talking about such a low percentage. Because even if you had gone through all the rigours, all the checks, well, first of all, the businesses probably would be getting their money about now. And secondly, most of them would have gone to the wall, uh, and you probably wouldn't have achieved a much better record of efficiency anyhow. So therefore, uh, uh, just to repeat something I've put into you in writing, I've found your staff to be incredibly effective, efficient and hardworking. And uh, therefore, I have no, no criticism whatsoever. But I, I, do, I have come across the issue of how you define a cafe from a takeout. Yeah. Is, the, yes. is the best method not to use what's called the 51% rule? If more than 51% of their income is takeout, is that not the way of establishing a takeout as opposed to a sit down cafe? Mm. Um, it's, um, it's mainly a wholly, wholly or mainly a certain business that we would be treating as, as one which had been uh, severely restricted. Um, takeaway businesses themselves were a little restricted in the opening hours. They all had to be shut by 11 o'clock um, for, for most of the past period. We're otherwise allowed to continue to treat uh, as normal. Um, now, you will all know in your own constituencies, lots of businesses which are uh, takeouts and uh, also have a small number of tables in. Um, so at, at what point uh, does the business um, tip over from being mainly takeaway into mainly sit-in has been a major problem. And depending on the nature of the business, um, that balance might shift from winter to summer. 
Um, and we have quite a lot of difficulty trying to discern this. It has been one of the most difficult and challenging parts of that exercise. What we have attempted to do um, as far as possible is allow the business owners to provide us with evidence about what share of their takings or business relates to the sit-in trade. Um, you know, mostly that would be in the form of like accountants letters or some sort of statement of accounts or, or financial information. Though um, not always is that information credible. Um, so we need to also apply a bit of judgment to it as well. Okay. Yeah, the, the other issue is that some business have done phenomenally well out of lockdown particularly the big supermarkets and the off-licences. Is there a potential that you could revalue their rates to reflect that uh, uh, windfall that they've achieved? Because I know certainly off-licences selling drink in my constituency have never had it so good, but the rates have not been adjusted to reflect that new situation. And the big supermarkets um, have done exceptionally well as well. well. Well, we'll come on to our rates reform um, a bit later um, in this session if, if we want to deal with it then, because I think that issue is bound up into a um, whole lot of other issues and different types of businesses which are also affected by the pandemic in different ways, both positively and negatively. So we'll want to talk about that during the next part of the session, if that's okay, Mr. Wells. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Chairman. Sir. Gemma? Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Ian. I just have one question. Um, I think actually, Ian, when you refer to the businesses that are on the on the beach, but I still have one outstanding issue, and it's a pub, and it says the case is still under review. Do you have any idea why that was? You know, off the, um, off the top of my head, it'd be difficult to say. It might be one of any one of a number of reasons. So, if you send me through the um, details of it, I'll have a look at it for you. Okay, thanks, Ian. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gemma. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, if we any other sort of points? Oh, sorry, Matthew, sorry. My question is really on the broader question about, I guess, reform. If we're, are we doing that yep. next? So, so I'm happy to wait until then for okay. doing this. Sort of, uh, sort of, Ian, who's going to speak on the uh, potential rates reform? Um, I'm just going to kick us off with a statement from that. Okay, Alan, over to you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I want to bring you up to date just with uh, where we are in reform. I know the committee have been interested in, in the reform, and uh, I need to put a bit of context around that, and I know we've talked, you've talked quite a bit about rates today. I, I need to go back a little bit and link this back to the business rates review. Um, um, I'm really struggling to, to – there's a lot of noise on the line. Can you hear me okay? We're having a bit of difficulty as well, Alan, to be honest. Uh, members uh, who are on start, right. I could just ask you to mute if you're not speaking, please. Okay, good. that's that's a lot better. Yeah, thank okay, you. Cheers. Thank you Thanks. for that. Yeah, I, I need to link back to the business rates review. You've talked a lot about rates today, and I think I need to put a little bit of context about this and just march through as quickly as I can uh, to bring us through from the review and some of the issues that came out of the review up to the current business rates holidays. You'll know that back in May 2019, the Perm Sec. Uh, Sue Gray, uh, at a time when the ministers were, were absent, the assembly wasn't functioning, uh, we did kick up a business rates review. Um, so for three years, the regional rate that was set yesterday was actually set at Westminster. A number of the rate reliefs lapsed during that time because there was no legislative power to renew. So things like the rural ATM scheme uh, that's actually uh, you, you've reviewed recently, a back in business scheme, they lapsed. We were able to renew the small business rate relief because it was a negative resolution procedure and we didn't change the policy. And so that, fortunately, was, uh, was renewed annually. Um, the department had taken forward the review. We did a lot of workshops and then we had a public consultation between September and November 19, a wide number of uh, public events and workshops. So some of the key themes that were coming out of that that are, are very important to rate reform, they were being collated really effectively when the executive and the ministers returned in, in, in January 2020. Uh, so the early consideration of some of the issues were rapidly overtaken uh, by the importance of, uh, and then the importance of other issues that had been raised during the consultation were, were in many ways accentuated by COVID. Um, and, and so that started to impact in February 2020. So to give you an example, um, 
one of the recurring themes from the workshops were that, uh, and, I, and I listened very carefully to what Mr. Uh, Dr. Bernie said earlier, but business rate payers consider that they're overtaxed. The rate payer, the rate poundage is excessive. A quote from that would have been, this is probably the highest multiplier in the world, effectively placing a 55 to 65 percent tax on the rental value of businesses. And in many ways, that is correct. It is a very high rate poundage. At that time, the rate poundage was 55 to 65p. And that was an issue that was well recognized. So a crucial consideration for an early decision, actually, if the minister was to reduce the regional rate with effect from 1 April 2020 by 18%. That incorporated 6% to adjust for the revaluation, but 18% was significant and an important realignment of business rates. It had immediately the effect of being business rates for 2021 back into the range of just 55, 50p to 59p. Uh, it's really important that we, you know, we've got we've got a rating system, but it has to be affordable. If it's not affordable, then the shutters will come down uh, on on premises. So the regional rate freeze then brought through this week uh, on the zero to low district rate increases uh, in non-domestic. Uh, has really helped because importantly, the overall multiplier has stayed in the same parish. So for this current year, um, we're, we're in around that same figure. However, the important thing is to note that England, Scotland and Wales have multipliers in the range of 49 to 53p. So we're still uh, much higher as a multiplier against rental value. Mm -hmm. That's one issue. Cause one of the, some of the other issues that you would expect were around reliefs and exemptions, um, sometimes very sector driven, uh, but uh, no surprise that we discussed about industrial derating, the future of small business rate relief, um, the need for that to be wider, the need for it to be more comprehensive. We discussed the rural rate relief for ATMs in the review. Uh, and, and, and many people thought that it was time for a root and branch review of uh, all of the reliefs. And indeed, some people thought that reliefs need to be time bound, and I, I probably wouldn't argue against that. Mentioned earlier, the need to re examine vacant rating, um, sport and recreation, charitable reliefs. Mr. Macarivi's paper would have gone to the review from earlier on, charitable trading. Responses were all very worthwhile, and the normal course of events. It's clearly something that the department of the minister would have progressed. However, the emergency situation that we then find ourselves in with the need to announce on 17th of March, it was the rates holiday for three months, followed in May by extending that to four months and then delaying rate bills. So that then bringing forward the further eight months for quite a number of businesses um, and that support package was 288 million that is greater than all of the other non-domestic reliefs um, we enhanced the rating support for uh, the, the vacant rating support we needed to do that you couldn't charge a, an empty shop 50 percent rates when the shop next door was paying nothing and as the committee knows we've brought back sbrr and rural rate relief just very quickly then, the, the consultation did highlight uh, the need for other rate incentives, the back in business scheme. But the, the, the 288 million of rates holiday, which was absolutely essential, uh, it was right across all retail hospitality. Therefore, it superseded. Uh, there, there would be no point in reviewing reviews at that, uh, other reliefs at that stage. Very quickly then, just other issues raised. Um, around the policy of, of district councils, uh, the transparency of rate revenue expenditure and the balance between non-domestic uh, and domestic tax bases. The minister, as you know, with the cooperation of this committee, um, has acted in a number of recommendations already uh, to reform. So the, the, the realignment of regional rate that I talked about earlier, uh, not, it didn't just adjust the quantum, but in fact, it, it adjusts slightly the relationship between domestic and non-domestic. When you real, I'm not going to go into the figures today, but when you realise that in many ways, 850,000 domestic rate pairs pay roughly the same as 55,000 business rate pairs, that, that, that relationship needs to be examined, if nothing else. The minister also brought in the later, later striking date but also, um, importantly, was the uncoupling um, of the relationship between 
uh, domestic and non-domestic rates at district council level. That's something that many of the councils were looking for. And I think, although it was introduced very late, uh, one council has taken up that opportunity, but that is there now and it's a reform. I think it's important because it will give district councils more opportunity to bring through what changes they need to make at district level that would be important and suitable for their, for their district. Um, that in, a, in many ways brings us up to date because then we'll know that the uh, further 12 months of, uh, of uh, a rates relief for 29,000 businesses is actually a piece of legislation that is further down your agenda at a cost of 230 million. Um, that's supporting um, and uh, supporting a wide number of businesses and many, many businesses have said if there hadn't been for the rates holiday, they just would not be able to, to reopen. Um, and so um, I think there's a lot of reform and some of the discussion from earlier, there, there will be a need uh, to, to look at a number of these areas. And again, this was, was mentioned in the, in the regional rate debate the other day, but clearly at this point in time, I think we, we as a department have done what we needed to do um, and, and the, quite a number of the reforms actually as we've moved through the last 18 months have actually been implemented. So hopefully that's a, hopefully a little bit, good bit of context uh, for the committee. Okay, thanks very much. Matthew? Thank you, thank you Alan, that was really helpful. Um, I need to check on a couple of things. The, I know it's not precisely comparable but relative to uh, is it England or England and Wales that has its own I think it's England has its own uh, is its own rating system for non non domestic rates are proportionately non domestic rates are proportionately higher in uh, sorry they're proportionally significantly higher here and non domestic rates uh, the comparables obviously council tax in England is Greater in England than it is here. Is that, is that right? As in, we are, in, we are. If you, when compared to England, it's we are more. I know they're not doing precisely the same thing, and they're precisely comparable. But is the is it fair to say that the burden on non-domestic rates is higher here than it would be in England? Yes, it's it's higher in that sense that the, the systems throughout England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland in terms of non-domestic rates are very very similar. Um, in fact, there's harmonisation uh, on, on principles and procedures, methodology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They're all based on rental value. They're all based yeah. on a very similar statutory assumption. Uh, the, the difference, slight difference at the minute, is that England, Scotland, and Wales are working on Reval 2017. In other words, the values are based at 2015. We're working at 2020 values 2018. There's a marginal difference in there, just to, mm -hmm. according to the valuation date. But, but the principles and the basis is exactly the same. It's a tax on, on occupation based on a rental value. Um, and the English system at the minute is, as I said earlier, is the multiplier of rental value is, is 49p up to 50 point something or other, whereas we're still well above that. Now, um, you can't say, well, of course, rents are a lot higher in certain parts of London or Manchester, Birmingham. Yes, of course they are, but they're, they're also lower in some places as well. But it is a tax based on rental value, and, and the rental value is what the market can bear, as you would know. So if I, if I think I can make uh, money in a shop, I'd be prepared to pay £10,000. If I could think I could make more, then I'd move to... A, better position, but the, but the basis is the same. The multipliers are different. Uh, and England and Wales and Scotland, uh, those multipliers are still higher than the average one here. We have that variation, whereas uh, in the other regions, they have uniform business rate. Council tax, as you know, aligns really more with domestic rates, but again, very, very that, there is more differences there, Mr. O'Toole, than there are in the non-domestic. Is that part of the explanation the, the longer term explanation for why our non-domestic ratepayers traditionally bear a greater burden than across the water because our domestic rating system is has been left relatively unreformed. No, our domestic system has been reformed much early, much later on. Our domestic system is reformed. The council tax system is not reformed, so mm -hmm. council tax in England, Scott, England, so it works on 1990 values. Yeah. 
Um, Northern Ireland works on 2000, we had a revaluation in Northern Ireland 2007, and Northern Ireland's working on an individual value basis. England is using a very bizarre banded capital value system based on 1990 values. So our system is actually reformed. Mm. Um, where the difference is, is that the, the, uh, what we're taking from the system, and this goes back to earlier discussions, is, is very different to, yeah. uh, to the burden. Uh, and the other issue for council tax is, and this word was used earlier, uh, council tax is, is very regressive because it's built on a one to three ratio. The person in the highest band age can only pay three times what's the person in the lowest band because Northern Ireland has a progressive system mm. uh, because it's built on individual values. But so there are, there are in many ways, our domestic system is there uh, and able, but, it, but the take from it is, is on average lower. And, yeah. and, and there are good reasons for that as well as maybe reasons why they can be stretched. You know? Yeah, okay. I think that was more what I meant in terms of, but, but, but that's a, a, a useful answer. Thank you. Um, uh, the other, the, the, the bigger question, and you've touched on it a bit in your um, uh, the, the, your, the summary you give us there. Um, uh, I mean, we, we're now in a situation where, for a large swathe of non-domestic, well, for all non-domestic rate payers, there it's been frozen. It will be frozen for two years by the time their their rates will have been frozen for two years by the time we get to the end of this financial year. Um, and for a significant cohort of um, non-domestic rate payers, they will have had a total holiday for two years. Uh, are you worried about um, the rate space when we enter uh, financial year 22-23? Well, the, the, the base, in a sense, will, will have to stay the same because um, until we have another revaluation, um, I know the minister is considering that. Um, we, 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 that will take. That will always take two years to bring through. Mm -hmm. So the base will stay the same, and the values are locked in 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 pre-COVID values, actually. Not so much as if that's an issue, but it's the relationship between sectors is, a, is an issue. So the, the base will stay the same, um, but the ability to raise against that base yes, that's, is that's obviously what, something. That's, sorry, that's that, what I mean in a, in a tax base sense. That's, that's will, what have I mean. to, will have to be grasped, yeah. Um, and so a, a lot will depend just to know, you know, it's, it's very, very early days, as you would appreciate, to understand yeah. where, we will, where we will be. But in six months' time, you know, we will, we will have to make hard decisions about where we're going to go. Uh, but, but that's about, in a sense, uh, you know, there, there isn't a way, you know, a, a, a pub or hotel have, will have money to pay a rates bill this year. Uh, yeah. And clearly that's the case, and that's the, uh, that's the reality. But, but how, how do we get people back into budgeting and planning, um, and what, what can that market, that sector bear yeah. in terms of taxation? That's the question. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's, so, uh, my, that's my next question. Um, the minute we're all people, pundits, commentators, politicians, journalists everywhere are trying to figure out what the structural shift is in economic behaviour, you know, if, if for the sake of argument, uh, that you know, structurally, COVID has accelerated behaviours and habits, and you know, scarred um, the high street enough so that, as for the sake of argument, there are twenty percent less economic activity. Just you know, stuff that was there. You know, there might be other things, other behaviours. You know, Pilates studios, nail bars, things that weren't there ten years ago. But the, you know, activity that was happening happened on high streets has been reduced by twenty percent. I mean, that will have a significant impact on the non-domestic rate space so what where are you going to from what evidence are you going to be seeking or where are you going to be getting your your information about that will it be um sort of survey based or will it simply be based on um uh, on you know on lps data in terms of occupancy or or uh, or, or what will it be that tells you that you know i mean i, I can see it in streets in my own constituency i'm sure others can but yeah, so there's just two different things here. So again, um, I don't want to get locked in the, in the terminology thing, but in, in terms of understanding these sector shifts that you're, you're, you're talking about, um, those sector shifts will, will can only be taken into account at a revaluation. And so England, Scotland and Wales will bring a revaluation. They have delayed their revaluation. They will bring through a revaluation on 2023. 
uh, in England, it will be based on one April 2021 values, mm -hmm. and Wales will be the same. Scotland are basing their revaluation on one April 22 values. And so in England, Scotland, and Wales, that revaluation that will come in in 2023 will address those sectoral shifts, the changes in the relationship between retail and office and manufacturing. Yeah. And until you have a revaluation, you can't really deal with those sector shifts. But what you're going to have to deal with, though, is the ability to pay and on and, and what figure will will sectors be able to afford. And so we will take economic advice uh, from, from an, obviously, a, a, a number of sources. We took economic advice uh, from Gareth Hetherington and, and Ulster University in, 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 this, in this further race holiday. And we will take the advice of, of experts as to what the market can bear. But the relationships will not be able to change until you have a revaluation. Can I just ask one really final point, just on the fiscal, very, very quick one. Uh, we were talking earlier on about the Fiscal Council that's going to be appointed, but also this new Fiscal Commission, which will be looking at our... Um, I presume you will, you are planning already to talk to them and engage with them, given that this is, you know, this is the, the one area of significant revenue raising that the devolved institutions do at the minute. Um, we already have... Our, we're, Ian and I already have our invitation for that for next week. Good. <laughs> Thank you, okay, Andy. that's it. Gemma? Sorry about this. I'm literally just after getting a constituency clearing, and maybe it's the answer, but I don't. Um, are the NRSS payments taxable? Ian, do you want to pick it up? Um, yes, they are. Thank you. Okay. Short and sweet. Yeah. You've just upset everybody who just got one of those payments now. Well done, Gemma. <laughs> okay, any other further questions? Okay, team, uh, conscious that uh, time is well and truly marching on. Uh, just uh, would we agree, just before I let sort of Ian and Alan go, that we should uh, write to the Department of Finance and seek sight of the 2019 rates review report? And can we also ask what plans the Department of Finance has to review the ability of the non domestic sector to pay rates in 2022 23? Uh, you know, if we're looking at another reval, uh, when will we know the state of the economic situation we're in? Uh, would we, and whether that can be brought forward, would we be content to do that? Chair, if I can just say that the the, the rates re review has not yet been finalised and published. It's not. It's but it's a document that maybe the minister. Yeah, well, it's a, it's certainly at draft stage. But yeah. as I said earlier, given the situation that we faced in January. You know, uh, it's it's and it's very much pre-COVID as well, now. Yeah. But yeah, you, we can look at that. Yeah. Yes, please, Alan. Thanks very much, Ian. Ian, Alan, as usual, as usual, it's been an absolute pleasure. And sorry we kept you quite late, but thank you very much indeed. Okay, team. We move on. Thank you. Uh, if we move on to the next item on the agenda, subordinate legis legislation SR 2021-116, the rates coronavirus emergency relief regulations in Northern Ireland 2021. The Department has made a statutory rule under Article 31C of the Rates, Northern Ireland Order 1977. Relevant papers are at page 318. The rule will allow businesses in the sectors of hospitality, leisure, entertainment, tourism, airports, childcare, retail, manufacturing and newspaper production to enjoy 100 per cent rates relief for 2021-22. The cost was previously given as £230 million. The Department previously argued that as this is a coronavirus emergency measure which is not designed to confer a competitor's advantage, it is not state aid as defined by the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. The Committee agreed that it was content with the related SL1 on the 24th of March 21. The Department advises that the statutory rule does not deviate from the original SL1. The rule is subject to negative resolution assembly procedure and has to come into effect on the 7th of May. This will be in breach of the 21-day rule. I can make sure, Stephen. Can you bring all the members into uh, start or spotlight, please? Yep, all in. Yep. Uh, therefore, our members are content that the Committee for Finance has considered the proposed statutory rule, statutory rule 2021-116, the Rates Coronavirus Emergency Relief Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules, have no objection to this rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. 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 Next item on the agenda, subordinate legislation, statutory rule 2021-119, the rates exemption for automatic telling machines in rural areas, order Northern Ireland 2021. The Department has made a statutory rule under Article 31C of the rates, Northern Ireland order 1977. Relevant papers are at page 386. The rule will continue the rates exemption for separate entries in the value, valuation list associated with around 100 automatic telling machines in designated rural areas. 
This exemption will apply to any ATMs which are valued individually, for example, those located outside petrol station or on high streets. ATMs located in banks, building societies or shops tend not to be valued for rating purposes. An exemption for such is therefore is not required. The Department estimates the costs at £200,000 per annum. The rule extends the exemption until 1 April 2022. The Committee agreed that it was content with the related SL1 on the 24th of March 2021. The Department advises that the statutory rule does not deviate from the original SL1. The rule is subject to affirmative resolution assembly procedure and will not become operative until the day after it is affirmed by the Assembly. Uh, are we all in the spotlight? Yes. yes. Are we content? Yes. That the Committee for Finance has considered the proposed statutory rule, Strategy Rule 2021-119. The rates exemption for automatic telling machines in rural areas order Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the report of the examiner, statutory rules recommend that be affirmed by the Assembly. Is this agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you. Uh, next item: uh, primary legislation pre-introduction financial reporting departments and public bodies, Northern Ireland Bill 2021. The Minister has provided in confidence a copy of the anticipated financial reporting departments and public bodies, Northern Ireland Bill 2021. Relevant papers are at page 402. Members are not asked not to publish the papers in question. Subject to executive consideration, the bill may be introduced later in May. All being well, the committee will receive a departmental briefing on the 26th of May 2021, and second stage probably scheduled for Tuesday, the 1st of June 21. And subject to the agreement of the Assembly, the committee stage commenced thereafter. The bill is short and allows the Department to issue guidance on the production of estimates to departments and designated bodies. The stated purpose is to have the estimate document match up to the annual reports and accounts for departments and other bodies. Members will wish to consider the length of the committee stage they wish to undertake. Standing orders allow 30 working days, which mean that, if unextended, the committee stage will end in mid-September 2021, which I think we all agree is not ideal. Uh, Paul, would you like to say anything to that? No. Okay. Any member like to say anything to that? Okay. Go ahead, Matthew. Um, no. Sorry. I'm, okay. Uh, yeah. Therefore, are members to consent content to receive a departmental briefing on the 26th of May, and to also seek a briefing from the bill office at the start of the anticipated committee stage? Are we agreed? Okay. Agreed. Okay. Moving rapidly on to correspondence and correspondence index, members are asked to note the index of the 12 received items of correspondence at page 417. Uh, item 12.2, departmental correspondence. Can I, can, I, can I propose? We've all received and had the opportunity to read this correspondence. Can I propose that on this occasion, given the passage of time, that we note as provided in the schedule and act as provided in the schedule, subject to any member wishing to raise anything about any specific letter? Uh, would you? Uh, anybody care to second that proposal? I'll second, second that proposal. Yeah. Would the committee, does any member of the committee wish to raise any issue on the correspondence? Three, two, one. No. All those in favour say aye. 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 Agreed. All right. Agreed. Done. Agreed. <laughs> OK, if we move on to the forward work programme, draft forward work programme is page 511. Owing to, some to, owing to some scheduling changes, we will only have two oral briefings. We will have only two oral briefings next week. Both are related to the Fiscal Council. Congressional Budget Office has declined to give formal or informal written or oral evidence to the committee, what? indicating that it's nothing to add to the OECD evidence. There you go, Matthew. Uh, it is currently engaged in servicing the needs of its own legislature. Oh, there you go. I oh, yes, I mean, are we going to U.S. citizens in the committee? <laughs> Not in the committee, but fairly closely associated to. <laughs> fairly closely associated Can to. I make a proposal that the chair's wife write to the Congressional <laughs> Budget Office and ask for? Yeah. A response from the OBR is still being pursued. As discussed last week, the Fiscal Council will probably give evidence on the 9th of June 2021, at which time the committee would set out its position in these matters. Are we content on the draft forward work programme? Agreed. Agreed. Any other business? No. We move into um, the camera session. The Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.